Now a House hearing with State Department Inspector General Howard Krongard. Democrats on the Oversight Committee have accused him of interfering with State Department investigations for political reasons. Mr. Krongard has asked about his brother's connection with the Blackwater security firm. Henry Waxman chairs this two-and-a-half-hour hearing. The meeting of the committee will come to order. This year, our committee has given a special focus to two areas, finding waste, fraud, and abuse, and examining how to make government effective again. Today's hearing on the performance of Howard Krongard, the State's, State Department's Inspector General, bridges both of these fundamental issues. Just as Congress tries to do its job of oversight, we set up inspectors general for uh, many of the departments and agencies to do the job of trying to stop uh, abuse and waste and fraud of taxpayers' dollars and to make sure that the uh, government is working more uh, effectively. Uh, when we look at the uh, State Department uh, actions in Iraq, we look at the, the reason for this whole hearing. As we examine the construction of the new Baghdad embassy, the oversight of Blackwater, and corruption in the Iraqi government, seven current and former officials in the Inspector General's office expressed concerns about Mr. Krongard's own oversight of the State Department. These officials and others who spoke with the committee during our investigation raised fundamental questions about Mr. Krongard's judgment, actions, and effectiveness. They described their serious concern about his inadequate oversight of the construction of the Baghdad Embassy, his failure to assist the Justice Department's investigation of Blackwater for arms smuggling, his refusal to pursue charges of procurement fraud implicating DynCorp, his intervention in the investigation of Kenneth Tomlinson, and his lack of independence in auditing the State Department's financial statements. The committee was told that due to Mr. Krongard's abusive management style, the office of the Inspector General is bleeding people right and left. What these officials told the committee is summarized in a staff report I'm releasing today, and without objection, it will be made part of the official record. One of Mr. Krongard's key responsibilities is providing oversight for the State Department's construction of the new Baghdad Embassy. In a previous hearing, we learned that the project will cost $144 million more than projected, is far behind schedule, and has potentially life-threatening construction deficiencies. There are also allegations that the building's contractor, First Kuwaiti, was involved in labor trafficking. When Mr. Krongard heard that his staff might investigate this issue, he sent them an email that said, as one official described it, quote, cease and desist all work, I'm taking care of this, end quote. Mr. Krongard conducted his own personal and unprecedented investigation of this potential scandal. According to Mr. Krongard, he interviewed six employees who had been handpicked by First Kuwaiti. He questioned them without a translator present and took virtually no notes. Mr. Krongard then concluded that there was no evidence that First Kuwaiti had committed human rights violations. The reaction of Mr. Krongard's senior staff to this investigation is remarkable. Mr. Krongard's deputy said the effort was, quote, unorthodox, didn't comply with any standards, and was the furthest thing from an investigation. Another official warned that Mr. Krongard's investigation ran the risk of inadvertently ruining a future prosecution. The former head of Mr. Krongard's audit division told us that the report would never pass muster in my organization and in any IG investigation that I've ever worked in, end quote. She also said, quote, it's an embarrassment to the community, end quote. A special agent was even more blunt, calling Mr. Krongard's report, quote, an affront to our profession, end quote. Given the strong condemnations from the professional staff in the Inspector General's office, this incident alone would justify today's hearing. Unfortunately, it is not an isolated incident. In fact, I don't believe it is even the most serious allegation 
raised against Mr. Krongard. In, course, in the course of our investigation, Mr. Krongard's investigators told us he placed First Kuwaiti off limits to investigation. They said he refused to pursue credible complaints about fraud, waste, and abuse in the embassy project and rejected proposals to audit the construction process during construction so that problems could be addressed as they happened. When Justice Department wanted to investigate these matters, it asked Mr. Krongard for cooperation. He refused repeatedly. In one instance, Mr. Krongard emailed his staff, stand, stand down on this and do not assist, end quote. In one mind-boggling sequence, Mr. Krongard, against the advice of his most senior staff, insisted on meeting, quote, a person of interest, end quote, in an investigation involving the embassy without assistance of counsel or investigators. Three days after meeting with Mr. Krongard, the potential suspect canceled the scheduled meeting with audit officials and left the United States. Shortly after that, Mr. Krongard insisted on meeting with another potential suspect during a trip to Iraq. This time, his senior staff not only advised him to cancel the meeting, but asked the Justice Department to instruct Mr. Krongard not to conduct haphazard witness interviews. Despite the additional warning from the Just Department, Justice Department, Mr. Krongard met with the individual. When he returned to Washington, he wanted to debrief his investigators on his meeting. The agents were worried that the information might taint them and ruin any credible investigation. They specifically asked Mr. Krongard not to share his impressions with them, but he ignored their request and sent one of the agents an email summarizing his conversation with the potential suspect. Well, none of these actions make any sense. When the Justice Department asked for cooperation, Mr. Krongard refused. When they warned him that his freelance investigations would jeopardize potential prosecutions, he ignored that. When his own staff tried to advise him on proper investigative procedures, he ignored them. If the reports the committee has received from the Justice Department and the Inspector General's senior staff are accurate, Mr. Krongard has acted with reckless incompetence. And the question about Mr. Krongard's performance aren't limited to the embassy in Baghdad. The Justice Department sought Mr. Krongard's cooperation as it investigated reports that a large private security contractor was smuggling weapons into Iraq. Instead of cooperating, Mr. Krongard apparently created a series of obstacles to the inquiry. One of Mr. Krongard's aides told our committee that, quote, there was absolutely no justifiable investigative management or any kind of reason for us to stop that investigation. The Justice Department shares that view and told the committee, at this juncture, we cannot determine all of the ramifications of the IG's conduct, but some of his actions have certainly impacted the investigation. For reasons that remain unclear, the line IG agents have been forced to funnel requests within their own agency through a congressional and public relations official. This is not the usual practice. The Inspector General also issued a statement without advanced coordination with department attorneys confirming the existence of this investigation, which is inconsistent with our law enforcement interests. That was from the um, what the Justice Department told our committee. Well, the Justice Department has advised us that Mr. Krongard's action resulted in a cumbersome and time-consuming investigative process and added multiple layers to our investigative efforts. As of this last Friday, the Justice Department still has not received the State Department materials it has requested. As Mr. Krongard revealed through some ill-advised comments, the company implicated in the weapons smuggling is Blackwater. We have now learned that Mr. Krongard's brother, Buzzy Krongard, serves on Blackwater's advisory board. We have also learned that Mr. Krongard concealed this apparent conflict of interest from his own deputy, even as he remained actively involved in monitoring the Justice Department's criminal investigation. 
In the course of today's hearing, we will also examine allegations about Mr. Krongard's actions regarding investigations into DynCorp and its subcontractors, his decision to allow the State Department to replace unfavorable financial audits with favorable ones, his contact with Kenneth Tomlinson to alert him to a possible investigation of wrongdoing, and his management approach to the Inspector General's office. It is a staggering list of allegations from Mr. Krongard's own staff. In committee interviews and depositions, the Deputy Inspector General, the Assistant Inspector General for Investigations, the Assistant Inspector General for Audits, their deputies, and the counsel to the Inspector General, along with many others, all criticized Mr. Krongard or his performance. And a long list of top officials including an, assist an Assistant Inspector General for Investigations, a Deputy ins ins Assistant Inspector General for Investigations, a Deputy Assistant Inspector General for Audits, the Head of the Office for Information Technology Valuations, and a Counsel to the Inspector General have all resigned since Mr. Krongard became Inspector General in 2005. As one current senior official told us, Joining Mr. Krongard's office was the worst mistake of my life. Now, I know that the uh, Republicans take a different, on this committee take a different view on this matter. Uh, today's hearing and Mr. Krongard's testimony will help us sort through the facts. I think we all understand the preeminent role the State Department now has in Iraq. The Department has to be operating in all cylinders if we have any hope of achieving real and lasting political reconciliation in Iraq. Countless lives and billions of dollars are at stake. There is no margin for error. That underscores why Mr. Krongard's office is so essential, why, why it needs to meet the highest standards, and why this hearing is so important. I want to now uh, recognize Mr. Shays, who is um, uh, sitting in for Mr. Tom Davis, the ranking member of the committee, and is acting on his behalf. And I want to yield him time for his statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Krongard, uh, welcome to Congress. And uh, uh, I just want to say, um, before I read my statement, you have been trashed uh, by this committee. They sent a 14-page letter to you and released it to the press. All were accusations and allegations and now you have a time to respond. Uh, and regretfully, there aren't as many uh, members on our side of the aisle here yet, but I'm sure this committee will be fair to you. And I want you to take every one of those allegations and deal with them as you will. Here we go again. Oversight by accusation and personal attack. Today, the committee is not assessing the State Department Inspector General as advertised, we will not be conducting an evidence-based appraisal of Inspector General I.G. Howard Krongard or the office he runs. Instead, we will ask to focus on a litany of salacious allegations in the futile hope loud repetition will do what exhaustive investigation so far has not, confer legitimacy on unproven conclusions. It's another sad example of the majority's high-profile, low-proof approach to oversight that yields far more rancor than reform. This so-called investigation also confirms an unfortunate penchant by the committee to leap to political convenient conclusions before looking carefully at witnesses who happen to be saying what the majority wants to hear. One whistleblower at a previous hearing turned out to have a past so checkered his motives and veracity were highly suspect, but easily discoverable evidence undermining his credibility was overlooked in the committee's unseemly haste to advance its anti-administration narrative. Here again, information from several whistleblowers forms the basis of the chairman's charges that the state IG interfered with ongoing investigations out of political loyalty to the State Department and the White House, censored damaging inspection and audit reports, and prevented investigations into allegations of wrongdoing in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
but in responding to questions on the record after those allegations have been made public, not one of the so-called whistleblowers had any direct evidence to support claims of political manipulation, nor did they provide information to substantiate the alleged dereliction of duty by the IG. They disagreed with the IG's judgment, but that alone does not make those judgments wrong or corrupt. One whistleblower said his conclusions about Mr. Krongard's political leanings was nothing more than a hunch. It's telling none of those whistleblowers will testify today. It's telling none of those whistleblowers will testify today. Their absence speaks volumes about the lack of substance behind this investigation. But their responses to specific questions about the chairman's charges are contained in a Republican staff report being released today. That report attempts to bring some balance to this discussion of how the State Department Office of Inspector General operates under Mr. Krongard. I ask that that be made part of the hearing record today. Without objection, that will be the order. That more balanced view has to include the fact the State Department IG has been institutionally weak and conflicted for many years due to limited funding, the demands of a mandatory global embassy inspection program, and a prolonged turf struggle with state diplomatic security services over fraud enforcement. Add to that dysfunctional mixed uh, Krongard's mercurial, some might even say abrasive management style, and the stage was set for complaints by disgruntled investigators to be amplified and exploited as political theater. When you get right down to it, Mr. Krongard's personal style seems to be the only issue here today. But earlier this year, the Government Accountability Office recommended a broad reassessment of state IG staffing, greater use of audits over inspections, and other steps to protect the IG's essential independence. Those should be the questions pursued by this committee, questions about capacity and performance, not wa water cooler gossip and personality conflicts. No inspector general should have his or her basic integrity and critical independence undermined by political second-guessing here in this Congress or in the executive branch. I hope we can move beyond these shallow drive-by assaults on political targets and focus this committee's considerable resources and reputation on addressing the deeper challenges to effective and efficient government. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, without objection, all members will be permitted to enter opening statements into the record. Uh, we're going to hear from Mr. Uh, Krongard. Uh, I want to ask unanimous consent that the questioning be started off with 10 minutes uh, controlled by the chairman and 10 minutes controlled by Mr. Shays. Uh, Mr. Krongard, we want to welcome you to our hearing today. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify do so under oath. So I would like to ask if you would rise and please raise your hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record uh, will indicate that uh, the witness answered in the affirmative. You have uh, uh, given us a prepared statement, and that will be made part of the record in full. We'd like to ask you, if you would, to um, give us your oral presentation. We will have a clock that uh, will indicate when five minutes are up, there will be a, a, um, uh, a, a yellow light indicating the last minute, uh, and then you read when five minutes is up. But I will not uh, enforce the five-minute rule. Uh, we do want to hear from you. And we, we would like to ask you to keep, uh, be mindful of the uh, time constraints so all members Mr. will Chairman? have an opportunity for questions. Yes, Mr. Um, Chairman. Given that he's the only witness and you have a litany of charges, I do hope you'll be very generous in allowing him to make his comments. I, I think that makes uh, sense, and we'll certainly do that. Thank you. Mr. Krongard. I, I had planned yes. to stay pretty close to the five minutes, so I will not go much over it. But thank you, Chairman Waxman, Congressman Shays, members of the committee. I come before you today voluntarily and anxious to respond to inaccurate allegations regarding my performance as Inspector General of the Department of State. By way of background, prior to May 2005, I had never been involved in government service. I was a lawyer for 40 years in the private sector, 
with 23 years experience as counsel for big eight and big six international accounting firms where I analyzed and defended many audits. Based on my experience, I was asked in 2004, without seeking it or even being aware of it, to take on the job of Inspector General at the State Department. That position had been vacant for some time. At 65 years of age, I came to office with no aspiration for any further posi uh, position and with no agenda other than to do the best job I could of carrying out the specific mission prescribed for me by senior management at the State Department at that time, namely to restore the capabilities of an IG office that had fallen into disrepair and was known to have dissension and rivalries and to make it more efficient, more professional, and more relevant to a dynamic post 9-11 world environment. In view of the allegations that I have politicized the office, have acted from partisan political ties, and believe my foremost mission is to support the Bush administration, I should point out that I've never had any political ties whatsoever. I've never been involved in any political party activities. I've never worked in a political campaign. I've never been a major contributor to any one party. And I do not recall even making a political contribution since the year 2000. When I was considered for and offered the IG job, I had never met or spoken to the president or any other person in the White House. And even today, after two and a half years in office, with the exception of a person I had known from working for a volunteer organization long before coming to Washington, I still have never met or spoken with the president or any other person in the White House. Mr. Chairman, at the time I was awaiting the confirmation process and had the natural apprehension as to whether I should take on a job I knew very little about, I read your persuasive report on the politicization of the inspectors general, and I thought I was very much the kind of person you were looking for. In the course of carrying out my mission to restore the capabilities of OIG and to make it more efficient, professional, and relevant, I sometimes clashed with a minority of people in OIG who were resistant to change, who had grown comfortable with a leaderless organization, or who may not have had the high level of skills or commitment needed in today's changing environment. These clashes were unfortunate, but I need to emphasize that I never allowed them to affect my judgment as to which jobs were to be undertaken or where resources should be allocated. A recurring theme in the allegations leveled at me is that I have impeded investigations that agents in OIG wanted to conduct. I want to say in the strongest terms that I have never impeded any investigation. Without getting into the specifics of any particular investigation, suffice it to say there are many times when experience and capabilities, benefits to be achieved, likelihood of success, availability of other investigative bodies to do the same work, available resources, both financial and human, and possibly conflicting parallel proceedings have to be weighed in determining whether a particular investigation proposed by someone in INV or OIG can or should be undertaken, and if so, when. I have tried to make these determinations as best I can with the objective of making OIG as effective, efficient, and relevant to the current world as I can. Expecting to be informed of investigations undertaken by OIG, asking for useful work plans to support them, and taking care to avoid conflicts and coordinate efforts with other work being done by others both inside and outside OIG does not constitute obstruction. With respect to the allegations of trafficking in persons at the new embassy compound, I did what I thought was best in those circumstances. I went to the multinational force Iraq inspector general, the recognized leader in the field of inspecting camps in Iraq, and I urged them to add the new embassy compound construction worker camp to the many worker and guard camps they were already inspecting. The work MNFI IG did was significantly more extensive than my own, but it corroborated my preliminary observations. I believed then and I believe now that MNFI IG was objective, experienced, 
and the most efficient and effective way for OIG to test the credibility of the many allegations to determine what, if any, further work was appropriate. MNFI IG has taken great offense at the mischaracterization of their work, and I share their feelings. In closing, let me share with you what I wrote to every member of OIG on May 2, 2007, the second anniversary of my swearing in. As I begin my third year, I urge each of you to reflect on what we have accomplished under very difficult circumstances, to take pride in your work and view each product you participate in as going out with your name on it, and to give me your support as we go forward. I also ask you, frankly, to make an effort to reduce some of the static that interferes with the harmony we would like to achieve. We have enough challenges to focus on without spending energy in rivalries between functional offices, the front office and staff, and foreign service and civil service, or in rumoring, backbiting, and complaining. Obviously, some of that is unavoidable human nature, especially in government and in any limited resource environment. Nevertheless, let's do our best to keep this to a minimum, to recognize things will never be perfect, to understand that all decisions cannot please all people, and most of all, to keep our eye on the ball that keeps us all here, to make OIG, the State Department, BBG, and the federal government better places, more efficient organizations, and more effective in accomplishing their objectives. Thank you, sir, and I'd be pleased now to respond to any questions the committee may have. Sir, I, I, I do, I, I would make a comment if I could, because one thing just came up that um, really does bother me, and that was an allegation concerning my brother. Um, I can tell you very frankly, I am not aware of any financial interest or position he has with respect to Blackwater. Uh, I, it, it, it couldn't possibly have affected anything I've done because I don't believe it. And when these ugly rumors started recently, I specifically asked him, I do not believe it is true that he is a member of the advisory board that you stated. And hmm. that, that's something I think I need to say. Okay, thanks. Well, Mr. Krongard, uh, I uh, gave an opening statement, and in it uh, I summarized a number of significant issues that I wanted to discuss this morning. But I want to start by asking you about new information we've received regarding a series of conflicts you've had with the Department of Justice. On January 18, 2007, the Justice Department requested assistance from your office investigating allegations of construction problems at the new Baghdad Embassy. According to John Dodona, the head of your investigations division, the Justice Department was seeking assistance in obtaining contract files, contract records, payment invoices, and inspection reports. But on January 23, you directed your investigators to stand down on this and not assist. The committee asked the Justice Department about this, and they told us they called you personally to ask for assistance in locating contract documents and locating and interviewing witnesses. The Justice Department in informed the committee that you gave them different reasons for your refusal. First, they said you claimed there were other pending matters involving First Kuwaiti. What other matters involving First Kuwaiti were you referring to? Sir, at that time, uh, both myself and MNFI IG had conducted our on-site work and were in the course of preparing reports. And I told the representative of the Justice Department of that work, and I did tell him that I obviously couldn't control the timing of his work but I said that if that could wait until those two pieces of work were completed and the reports issued, it would preserve the independence of those without possibly suggesting that either MNFI, IG, or myself was in any way 
affected by Those what reports were about labor trafficking. And what the Justice what Department asked you about was information about contracting uh, possible criminal actions with regard to the contracting itself. Uh, sir, I, I differ with that. The s scope of work that the person from the Justice Department called me about, and I believe some of this is under seal, so I'm a little bit, um, it's hard for me to e express other than the scope was far broader than what you have just said and did include the trafficking issues. Uh, you're talking about under seal, uh, your investigations under seal, or no, the Justice Department? No, the Justice Department. Okay, but you told the Justice Department you couldn't give them the contracting information and cooperate with their inv investigation on contracting abuses that might be criminal, involve criminal activities, because you're doing your own investigation. Your own investigation was on labor trafficking, and therefore you didn't want to give them the information on the other issue until you completed your investigation. Is that your position? No, sir, it is not. Th there were actually three things that uh, the Justice Department was talking about. They were talking about conducting interviews, having representatives from my staff conduct interviews for or with them. They were talking about obtaining documents from the State Department, and they were talking about these issues regarding the conduct of the workers at the new embassy compound, which, by the way, was the essence of what started their work. Their work expanded from that. With respect to, read to you uh, 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 something that came out in our, uh, in our report that I want you to react to. Uh, one internal email sent in January 2007 reported that the Justice Department was seeking help from the Inspector General in investigating billing for work done improperly or incompletely, theft of materials and labor and alleged corruption of a State Department official overseeing contract performance. Now, that should have been a high priority. They're looking at criminal actions. They want your help, and you're telling them, no, I, I can't help you. I've got other things going on. According to the committee's investigation, you had already refused to allow your investigators to open a case. There were no audits underway, and we could identify no other investigation at the time this Justice Department request was made. The Justice Department also informed the committee that you said this was not the sort of thing the Office of Inspector General did, and it would be a conflict for the OIG to be investigating those complaints and conducting a law enforcement investigation. Is it your position that there is some provision of law that prohibits your office from assisting the Justice Department? Sir, you've made a lot of statements. I wonder if I could. I, I was trying to write down the ones. Can I comment? Well, my as question I have to you uh, that I want you to answer is uh, Do you believe there's some pro pro prohibition in law from your cooperating with the Justice Department uh, and helping them when they are asking for your assistance? Absolutely not. In fact, I. I I try and cooperate with the Justice Department as much as I can, and I applaud their efforts. And what happened here, as soon as we were able to find out what it was they were doing and segment what we could and couldn't assist them with because of resource and other qualifications, I did do exactly what you have just asked, and I gave them the Deputy Assistant Inspector General for Audits together with another person that were given to them to work with them to accomplish the very objectives they wanted to accomplish. Well, your own uh, investigators uh, had a different view. Uh, this is how one of your investigators responded to the news that you had refused the Justice Department request. Wow, as we all know, this is not the normal and proper procedure. When looking at the IG Act, DOJ, and PCIE guidelines, and the OIG community as a whole, we are supposed to work under the direction of the USAO DOJ. I am stunned. I hope you documented the orders that were provided to you. Wow. In fact, the committee has identified at least three other occasions in which the Justice Department came back to you and asked for assistance on this investigation. In May, the Justice Department sought your assistance obtaining invoices and inspection records on whether blast proof walls in the embassy had been constructed properly. In June, the next month, the Justice Department sought your assistance obtaining documents pertaining to another first Kuwaiti contract. And in July, the Justice Department requested assistance in getting a copy of two cables 
mentioned in a front page article in the Washington Post regarding construction problems at the embassy. In all of these cases, you refuse their requests. You uh, have also apparently resisted the Justice Department's efforts to investigate whether Blackwater was engaged in arms smuggling in Iraq. On July 10th, John Dodona sent an email notifying you that his office would be working with the Justice Department on this. This is John Dodona who works at your uh, Office of Inspector General. The next day, you ordered Mr. Dodona and his team to stop immediately. You then directed Mr. Dodona to arrange a personal briefing from you, for you, from the Justice Department, and you told him he could not proceed in any manner until the briefing takes place. After you received that briefing, you agreed to allow one of your investigators to assist, but you then assigned your congressional and public relations director to oversee his actions. Although she had no law enforcement background, you described her as your alter ego and directed her to provide you with operational awareness. You halted an investigation, demanded a personal briefing from the Justice Department, assigned your Congressional Affairs Director to keep tabs on the investiga investigation. Do you agree that these steps were highly unorthodox? No, sir, I do not. I, you've made a lot that is very hard to me to respond. Let me take the last one first, which is, I believe you used the name uh, Blackwater. In early July, Stuart Bowen, the Special, Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, asked for the assistance of my office in conducting an audit of two Blackwater contracts. We agreed to do that, and we were already beginning. The initial cooperation that we were rendering was the collection of data, the collection of information. Did you feel that helping uh, Mr. Bowen meant that you shouldn't be helping the Justice Department? Sir, let me finish if I can. I think, yes, I do, in, until it's cleared up. I came in, actually, I believe it was the following morning after we, Mr. Bowen and I had completed all of our arrangements for the cooperation, and at 7.30 in the morning, I found an email from Mr. Dedona telling me for the first time of an investigation that was long, um, down the road in which our investigators were ins assisting U.S. attorneys in a criminal investigation of two Blackwater contracts. And when I looked at the papers, they were the exact same two. They have a string of numbers, about nine letters and numbers long. They were the exact two contracts that we were already assisting a civil audit. And I was immediately concerned that for us simultaneously, to be assisting a criminal investigation into the exact same two contracts that we were already assisting a civil audit into raised questions of parallel proceedings which needed to be deconflicted before one infected or contaminated the other. Well, let me uh, interrupt you by saying that what you're talking about was an audit of uh, con uh, contracts. This was a totally different matter, a criminal investigation into arms smuggling and the Justice Department says they still haven't received the documents they were seeking four months ago through your office. This is how Justice Department summarized your actions. At this juncture, we cannot determine all of the ramifications of the IG's conduct, but some of his actions have certainly impacted the investigation. For reasons that remain unclear, the line IG agents who have broad power to obtain documents and other evidence relevant to any investigation they are conducting have been forced to funnel requests within their own agency through a congressional and public relations official. And this is not the usual practice. So it seems to me you're making a lot of judgments as to who ought to get information and help from your office. And it seems to me you've given a very low priority to the Justice Department involving criminal actions that they're investigating and deciding whether to pursue. Sir, I uh, have a different view of what happened. First of all, the contracts were exactly the same two contracts. Those were the contracts that the criminal investigation was going forward with. Number two, I did not institute a delay. I said immediately, and that email that has been floating around for a long time cuts off the part that says, until I can get a briefing from the AUSA and I made myself available immediately by telephone, I did not expect them to come up to visit me. I didn't expect anything other than an immediate phone call so I could tell them of these conflicts that I was facing because I needed to have them know. 
Now, as far as what they have said or what someone has said they said, I don't know. I can only go by what they said to me. And, sir, after that meeting, I received a letter from the chief of the criminal division of that U.S. Attorney's Office in which he said, thank you for taking the time to meet with Deputy Criminal Chief so-and-so and me earlier this week when we were in Washington. We appreciate the frank exchange of views and information. We will remain cognizant of the issues you raised and will work closely with you and your staff to move this matter forward in the most expeditious way possible. Your decision to allow your case agent to continue to work on this matter will make that much easier. Again, thank you for your time and interest in this matter. With kindest regards, I am. Sir, I think that I helped deconflict the issue. I made available to them the best young investigator I had, and this idea that I put a congressional and public affairs person in charge is simply untrue. What happened was the data collection assistance that was being rendered for Seeger was being done by the person who normally does the data collection. That happens to be the person who is the congressional and public affairs person. Since the same contractual materials was being sought by the U.S. attorney in the other matter, I said to her and to him, she can just make double copies of what she's making for Seeger and give it to you. So she was not doing any investigative. I had the special agent who was assigned to them doing that and her role was simply of collecting and gathering data. Now, as to whether that has been produced, I really don't know. I put into the process um, a program to obtain those materials. I, I suspect, as usual, that there are concerns from Diplomatic Security, which is the resident agent for these papers, and what gets shown and what gets produced, but I really don't know whether it's been produced or not. I know that this person has been working hard to satisfy the concerns and needs for information of both the Seeger and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and those were my instructions. Thank you, Mr. Congard. I'm going to turn over uh, the time now to uh, Mr. Shays, but I do want to point out what you've said to us contradicts what almost everybody else has said. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Krongard, um, it's uh, The chairman is giving you time to answer questions, but when he throws five charges at you at once, you'd have to be a genius to remember all of them. And I just hope that people in this hearing room don't make the assumption, because you didn't deal with five charges at once and respond to them, that they don't have answers. Uh, we tried to figure out what are the accusations of this committee. And so we are going to have questions about partisan Republican motivations, too close to the State Department allegations, financial statement audit, the embassy compound, the car road charge, sensors and inspector reports, weapons smuggling matter, counterfeit computers, financial audit, refusal to produce documents, the travel charge, abrasive management style. And in the end, I think it's going to come down to your management style. But uh, let me just go through, even though you had it in your statement, I want to go through and at least deal with one of these issues and get it off the table, and then we'll get on to the next. And I want to deal with the, the allegations of a partisan Republican motivation. First, to what extent do you believe your mission at IG is to support the Bush administration? Absolutely not, sir. To what extent have you been involved in politics or contributed any money to a political campaign during your adult life? I've not been involved in any political activities. I've given uh, contributions which, according to the records that have been made public, and I think they're accurate, I have not made any contribution uh, ever to the current president or since 2000. And prior my to understanding that, is the last contribution you gave was to Bill Bradley. Uh, I may have made a contribution in the course of attending a function put on by the Republican senatorial campaign, I believe, something like that. I think I attended one of their functions. Before for, 2000? It was before 2000. Yeah. Have you ever met or spoken to President George Bush or any of his senior staff? No, sir. You've never met him? No, sir. And you've never spoken to any of his senior staff? I don't know where senior cuts off, but there's a person who recently joined who I had known long ago when we were both on the board of a um, nonprofit public uh, awareness corp um, entity, and I knew him then. I have not um, seen him. But Do you have is. any relationship or connection with other people in the Bush administration? No, sir, none. Have you ever been to the White House function any time during this Bush administration? Sir, I don't think I've ever been in the White House except as a tourist. Do you have any relationships or connections with or financial interest in State Department contractors which might be the subject of an OIG work? No, sir, I do not. 
uh, when making decisions about the work of the OIG, have you ever taken political considerations into account? No, sir, I have not. When making decisions about the work of the OIG, have you ever been influenced by a desire to protect the Bush administration? No, sir. When making decisions about the work of the OIG, have you ever been influenced by a desire to protect a particular company? No, sir. Do you have any idea why someone would allege that you have any political motivation or corrupt, that you're corrupt or both? Yes, sir. I do have, I do have reasons to believe why people would do and, that. And in a short um, sentence or two, explain what you think they are. Well, sir, it's no secret that I came into, I, I took on a mission to come in and try and repair something that had been in a bad way. I knew from the beginning that that was going to put me into conflict with some people who were resistant to change, who were resistant to what I was trying to accomplish, and I did make some enemies. And the people that have been interviewed by this committee are not the entire OIG, and they're not the universe. And while the large percentage of their sample may be very much against me, there are people in the OIG who supported what okay. I did. Let me say that that was the basis for the chairman's 14-page uh, letter. And the reason why we're releasing this document is those individuals came before our committee and we questioned them. Uh, and so we say, the partisan political favoring allegations, did you have any awareness of those before they were outlined in this letter? That I mean, well, I can't say no, I can't really answer that. Uh, uh, further questions. Do you believe the Inspector General's foreign mission to support the Bush administration? I could not say that, no. Um, I, uh, we asked, no direct evidence, not that I know of. I have no knowledge the way, one way or the other. These are what these individuals are all saying to these questions. These allegations they made, then when we put them under oath, and the reason they're not here is they would be put under oath. So you had to deal with, frankly, you've had to deal with gossip, not people willing under oath to make these charges. Uh, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to uh, Mr. Eisen. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick up a little bit there. Now, uh, you were for general counsel to Deloitte, right? Yes, sir. And uh, it, it's pretty tough to, to, to be the, the pinnacle of an organization like that filled with career auditors and accountants and lawyers, isn't it? It's a challenge. Uh, these are smart people who... Uh, sometimes do a good job, but if they don't, they certainly are very good at explaining themselves when they don't do a good job. Isn't that true? Truthfully, yes. Okay, so you, you, you've kind of undersold yourself a little bit ago. You, you talked about 40 years of not having the right experience, but it seems to me like the selection of you for this job and your acceptance made you unique, uniquely qualified to oversee career auditors who either do a good job or do a good job of telling people they do a good job. Yes, sir. Uh, when you arrived, uh, essentially, was the latter more true, that there were a lot of people who were very good at explaining how good they were, but the results at the State Department over literally decades had been abysmal when it came to accountability. Wasn't that true? I think that's fair. Okay. During your tenure, uh, one of the things that the chairman has repeatedly come back to last uh, in July was uh, the not yet occurred, but the possibility of cost overruns on the Iraq embassy, even though it's on time and on budget, and in fact there's blue, blue dots everywhere where they're fixing the things that the contractor didn't do. Wouldn't you say that when it came to auditing by anybody, that auditing a large project in a combat zone was a unique task that at best uh, sending people over there would have had a limited ability to really get to the bottom of it. I mean, you made a decision not to essentially let auditors endlessly go over to look at a building, but rather made them uh, focus on shortcomings and limited their trips to Iraq. Isn't that true? Uh, to be very candid, sir, it was in some ways the reverse. I wanted auditors to go. I instituted a, three jobs which required auditors to go. I'm talking about auditors now, not investigators or inspectors. And in each case, the jobs had to be cut short or canceled because the auditors refused to go to Iraq. Because I did not have auditors willing to go to Iraq. Because, in fact, it's a combat zone. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I'm going to make a, a quick statement, and, and one that I, is not intended to help you or hurt you, but the, Iraq is a unique situation. We haven't had an ambassador in charge of a war zone in modern history. We normally leave a general in charge of a war zone and bring the ambassadors in when the conflict is over. 
if we did what we had done in every other situation, this embassy would be built uh, under the Corps of Engineers and the State Department wouldn't have oversight. Isn't that sort of a historic fair statement? It predates me, but I th it, it confirms my understanding. Yes. Would it surprise you to know that a few hundred feet from here, a building of a lesser size is going to cost more money? The Capitol Visitor Center is uh, has been seven years plus in the making, was already underway when September 11th hit, is not finished today, will not be done for a year, will be at least three and a half years. Combat zone. Yeah, no combat zone, uh, with the possible <laughs> exception of the change in administration here. But uh, that, in fact, it's a half billion dollars. And to be candid, they won't tell us why it takes a year after completion before there's any chance of occupancy. Uh, would you say that uh, the Capitol Visitor Center and the, uh, the, the uh, embassy in Iraq have some similarities? Or is it, in fact, that the embassy in Iraq, in spite of everything, being in a combat zone, being impossible to get uh, auditors and investigators and so on to, to want to go to, uh, that, in fact, it appears at this point to be like any large construction process, progre pro project and simply is going through the making the vendor do their job after the fact. And, and we're not talking about the human trafficking. I'm just talking about the project itself. As far as I know, I don't know anything different. I don't know much since I was last there in September. But as of September, that seemed like a fair comparison. Okay. Well, the only reason is this is our third hearing where the, uh, that center is, is a center of attention. And it, it's sort of amazing that something which, as far as we know, is still on time and on budget. Uh, is investigated, well, the Capitol Visitor Center seems to uh, be beneath uh, investigation as it is beneath the Capitol. My time is, is, is disappearing quickly, but you have had a tough job. You've had a style that has been accused of being abrasive, but you appear to have made some change. I want to give you an opportunity, though, to talk about the two seats that are not there today, the two Justice Department people who would make unofficial, unsworn uh, statements and then not be here to answer questions. I don't want you to disparage them, but I want you to talk about what you believe the correct role is of your investigations versus their investigations, where you assist and where you continue doing your own investigations. Because that seems to be the legitimate subject here of when do you simply stand down and hand everything to them and when do you continue your investigations? Sir, if I can just uh, correct, the Justice Department uh, information, as I know, came through last night. I heard about it for the first time last night. So uh, when you're talking about the two empty seats, I'm not sure if you're talking about the investigators from my staff who were the principal motivators or whistleblowers, whatever it is, or the Justice Department people. I'm not aware that the Justice Department is disparaging me. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, could we have those uh, those records made uh, made part of the record so that we could actually have all of us see the uh, uh, the actual accusations that you you alluded to in your uh, your statement? Uh, I think it's certainly of public interest. Madam Secretary, uh, I want to inform the gentleman that the Justice Department provided the Republican staff with the same information that was provided to us, so you have the same information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, then can I, uh, without a, uh, objection, submit it for the record? We'll uh, take it under submission. There are some issues the Justice Department raised with the, both of our staff. So you're objecting to it going into well, the record, even though it's been alluded to here, Mr. Chairman? I will. Uh, I don't want to object, but I don't want to agree to it. So I'll temporarily object, and we'll consider to review the matter. Thank you. Let the gentleman continue. Let me, I, I will try and answer the Justice Department in generalities because there are some specific investigative concerns that I believe the Justice Department has. But, and this will go back in part to what the chairman was saying before. I never refused the Justice Department assistance at any time. I asked for them to tell me what it was they needed, and I wanted to tell them the parallel proceedings that I was involved in. I wanted to make sure that I had the resources. Remember, the Justice Department is used to dealing with agencies around government that have large numbers of investigators. At any one point in time, I have something like 7, 8, 10, 12 total investigators. I was shocked when I came into this office to learn that of the 29 members or 28 members of the PCIE, which include agencies like TVA and um, Railroad Retirement Board and things that you don't think of as being law enforcement agencies, 
the State Department OIG ranked 23rd in the number of investigators. I came into an organization that historically was audit and inspection focused by law, the Foreign Service Act of 1980, which mandates the OIG to inspect on a five-year cycle all embassies and missions around the world, 275 of them. So investigations takes approximately 10 percent of our personnel and 10 percent of our resources. So in dealing with the Department of Justice, I had to make sure that they understood that we had limited experience, limited resources, and if a person was already working on one Justice Department matter when we were doing on these very same things, three and four, the new embassy compound had at least three different Justice Department divisions doing investigations. So when I spoke to them, I was trying to deconflict, coordinate, and make sure that the resources were available. Mr. Kongard, uh, yes. uh, Mr. Shays has a quick question sure. of you, and then we're yeah, going to I just on. want to clarify one point. So the issue about cooperation with Justice, Justice was actually asking that some of your personnel be directed under their, um, under their uh, uh, management to almost, in a sense, detail them to, with the Justice Department for a period of time? N not almost. Uh, in, in the one that we were talking about regarding the major contractor, that person was, in effect, assigned to them. And as I understand one of their complaints last night, they are very upset that that person, who again is one of my best people and the only person that had been so, willing to so go to Iraq, has taken on another so assignment. So you, you were you basically uh, objecting to losing one of your seven people and wondering, I would think, why they couldn't detail their own people instead of your people when you only have seven. Well, the latter. I was wondering why they couldn't detail their own, but it wasn't that I was concerned about detailing them. I was happy to help, and his, the letter I read to you says that I did that. The problem was when another investigation has come up and that gentleman has gone to Iraq, I understand that they're now unhappy that he has left their investigation to do a different investigation. It's called opportunity yeah. cost. Sorry? Give, it's called opportunity cost. If you've used person one way, you can't use them somewhere else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, a, of course, a leading question you were just asked. But it seems to me if you have people working on the issue that the Justice Department is seeking information about, you should share the information with the Justice Department rather than say they have to go through your congressional liaison person before they have any contact with the people who are doing the work for the OIG. I'm going to move on Ms. to others. Ms. Chairman. I'm going to move on to others. The time has expired. But I do also want to make one other comment. Uh, we've had complaints from the Republicans that we don't have the record, we don't have the people that testified before our committee here to testify again. All of the witnesses that testified under oath in the depositions and were subject to cross-examination by the Republican lawyers as well as our staff and we were, are going to be releasing the transcript of those depositions. So it isn't is it that we didn't have those witnesses here to testify again. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. 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 Chairman. Mr. Chairman, why wouldn't you have them come before the committee so the public could hear their responses and we could ask them questions? They're the ones who made the allegations. The people that made the allegations were subject to cross-examination. They testified under oath. If they Not before this committee. If the gentleman would permit, they testified before this committee's deposition under oath, if they lied under oath, they're subject to criminal penalties. And that, uh, that uh, should just be understood. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Krangard, it's good to see you. And um, I note that uh, two very interesting things, that you speak very much about deconflicting, so you have a sensitivity to conflicts, obviously. And second, you, I note that after the chairman asked you, I mean, before the chairman asked you questions, but after your statement, you gave us some additional information about your brother, Buzzy Krungard. And what you said, that it's to your knowledge, he had no financial interest and he did not sit on the board of Blackwater. Is that correct? Well, yes, let's, sir. Let's, let's look at that real quickly. One of the biggest scandals to hit the State Department in recent memory has been the lack of accountability for the Blackwater USA. Last month, Secretary of State testified before this committee that for more than four years there has been a hole in the law that allows Blackwater to escape criminal liability for killing innocent Iraqi civilians. Just today, papers reported that Federal agents 
investigating the September 16th episode in which Blackwater security personnel shot and killed 17 Iraqi civilians have found that at least 14 of the shootings were unjustified and violated deadly force rules in effect for security contractors in Iraq. Your role as Inspector General is to investigate waste, fraud, abuse in the State Department. But your office has not completed any investigations into Blackwater activities, although there is a Justice Department investigation underway. Uh, you have taken several unorthodox steps that delayed or impeded that investigation, such as requiring a personal briefing from the Justice Department and requiring all investigative documents to go through your Congressional Affairs Director. I am trying to understand why you are so reticent about investigating Blackwater. I would like to show you a letter the committee obtained and ask you to comment on it. This letter was sent from Eric Prince, the CEO and founder of Blackwater. He showed that letter on July 26, 2007. Mr. Prince uh, sent this letter to Alvin uh, Buzzy Cron Crongard, your, your brother. The letter invites him to serve on Blackwater's Worldwide Advisory Board. Uh, this is what Mr. Prince says. He says, and this is Mr. Prince to your brother, the one that you said is not involved with Blackwater. He says, being a member of the Blackwater Worldwide Advisory Board will provide you with a stellar opportunity to continue to support security, peace, and freedom. Your experience and insight would be ideal to help our team determine where we are and where we are going. Mr. Prince's letter goes on to explain that the main purpose of the Board is to provide leadership advice about the path the company should follow. Now, here is the second document. This is a September 5th email that Eric Prince sent to your brother. It says, quote, welcome and thank you for accepting the invitation to be a member of the Board. My question is this. Did you know that your brother Bussy Krungard is on Blackwater's advisory board? Sir, I dispute that. As far as I know, that is not correct. This is, I, I would, you asked me to comment on this letter. Yeah. Sir, my brother served honorably as a captain in the United States Marine Corps. He served as the executive director of the CIA. He has been involved in a lot of activities involving security. So it's no surprise that someone like Eric Prince would invite him to continue to support security, peace, and freedom. There is nothing in here that suggests that my brother accepted this July 26 invitation. What you have now shown me is an email from Eric Prince to a large number of people that I assume were all uh, people who received this. I don't see anything in here that suggests my brother accepted or attended, and as far as I know, he did neither. Well, let me go on then, uh, because I do think the letter indicates that he did accept. But, Mr. Prangard, this is one of the most high-profile issues facing the State Department. And your testimony today is that you didn't, didn't know your own brother is on the Blackwater's board. I find that very difficult to believe. Let me ask you this. Mr. Conger, did you know where your brother is this week? Do you know? No, sir, I don't. According to this email, Mr. Prince invited your brother to be uh, a board, at a board meeting to discuss strategic planning. At, and this meeting is taking place right now in Williamsburg, Virginia, this week as we speak. Staff contacted the hotel to speak to your brother, and the hotel confirmed that he was scheduled to be there. And did you know, did you know that? No, sir, I did not. Um, and so, I mean, now, if, if your brother is a board member, uh, which you said he's not, but if he is, would you consider, since you're, I know you're sensitive to con conflicts, would you agree that you, you should recuse yourself from anything doing, uh, dealing with uh, Blackwater investigations? Yes, sir. And that was why, first of all, by the nature of my brother's work, you should understand that we have never discussed his work or my work. So I had no reason to even think that he had any involvement with Blackwater. But when these things surfaced, I called him and I asked him directly. He has told me he does not have any involvement. He does not have any financial interest. If you're telling me that he does, absolutely, I would recuse myself. You will, you will recuse yourself? Absolutely. Immediately? Absolutely. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. McHenry? I, I thank the gentleman for being here today. This is uh, just another series of what I refer to as drive-by oversight. Uh, you were um, 
before this committee in July, I believe, five months later, um, you're brought back to rehash the very same questions you're asked in July. Thank you for your patience. Um, but again, this is, there are a numerous accusations just in the chairman's opening statement uh, leveled at you. Um, what is interesting is if these accusations, uh, you know, which were laid out in July, if, if any of this stuff uh, the chairman believes or the majority believes is true, then this committee is called Oversight and Government Reform. Previous Congress, it was Government Reform and Oversight. Just a matter of emphasis between the two parties. So this committee has been all about oversight in committee hearings like this. But there's been no recommendation from this committee in this Congress for any type of government reform to fix these accusations, these problems. So let me go a little further here. There are accusations uh, about uh, Blackwater. Uh, is there uh, an inspector general that deals with Iraq? Yes, sir, the Seeger. Okay, a special IG yes, uh, for Iraq. Yes, sir. Uh, does the special IG, and I know there are a number of issues related to this, but does the special IG um, look into accusations about Blackwater? Yes, as I said before, he is conducting an audit with our assistance of some Blackwater contracts, the same ones as the subject of the criminal investigation. Okay. Is there, does that special IG also deal with the embassy in Iraq? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. It depends on what the issue would be. Okay. All right. But we've had testimony um, uh, from a number of different folks. There are uh, between 10 and 12 entities that are uh, dealing with the issues uh, pertaining to the embassy. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, to ensure that the product is delivered. Correct? Yes. All right. Um, w what is the contract that is being used right now for uh, the building of the embassy? Is it a fixed price contract? There are eight principal contracts. I think all of them were fixed price. Um, and to get back, if I can use a second of your time to tell the chairman that was Absolutely. saying back in January there were no audits. We actually did. I had requested an audit that is still in process uh, of the manner in which those contracts were let and whether they complied with federal contracting law and regulations. And that audit has been going on since, I believe, January. All right. Thank you. Um, in regards to the U.S. Embassy, how much oversight and investigation is too much? You know, when you have 10 to 12 different entities doing the, the same thing, um, do you think that there is this tipping point? Um, you know, one of your assistant uh, inspector generals uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Shays mentioned is uh, John Dodona. He was just deposed and he said that there are 10 to 12 different entities uh, pursuing embassy related issues. Now, it would seem to me that there is some true need for government reform here when you have 10 to 12 different groups looking at similar, if not the same thing. Uh, is there, you know, some level of streamlining that we should look at? Sir, I hesitate to tell you how to, you're so much better at doing your job than I am. <laughs> um, the American people, 14% of the American people agree. At, 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 at the end, sir, there are two things I can suggest that have to do with government reform in this area, but I don't want to take your time on that. No, but, absolutely. Go right ahead. Well, some of you may be aware that uh, a committee, as the Subcommittee on International Organizations, Human Rights and Oversight of the Committee on Foreign Affairs had a hearing about a week or 10 days ago. Uh, also concerning my office, and I did a lengthy response to them. And in the course of that, I did make two, uh, I won't call them suggestions, but I raised two issues that I do think need to be considered. And they were things that had bothered me from the day I took this office. The first was the Foreign Service Act of 1980, which mandates the inspections of embassies around the world and has historically created my office as an inspection-oriented office first an audit-oriented office second, and almost as an afterthought, an investigatory body. In fact, the um, committee reports of the Foreign Service Act of 1980 are replete with statements about how unique this office was and how different it was from the normal IG office, which mm -hmm. was audit and investigation. So that was one thing that I suggested be considered. The second thing I've been puzzled about, and I suggested in my letter to Mr. Delahunt to be considered, is why 
BBG does not have its own inspector general uh, because all the time that people talk about the resources that I have as inspector general of the State Department, I'm also inspector general of the Broadcasting Board of Governors with worldwide issues for them, and I don't get a single extra penny or person to do that. And Corporation for Public Broadcasting has an IG, and other comparable bodies have an IG. So I just uh, think maybe this committee would consider that as well. Thank, thank you, Mr. McHenry. Your time has expired. Ms. Watson? I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want Mr. Congor to know I take my position on this committee very seriously. I was a member of the State Department, did head up an embassy, and we need to put a laser beam on the activities in our embassies around the globe. If your brother is currently at the hotel in Williamburg, Williamsburg, Virginia, sitting on that board, would you repeat that you would recuse yourself? Okay. Immediately. Okay. Then maybe you want to do it today. Recuse myself from anything having to do with Blackwater. Yes. I mean, I wouldn't Blackwater. step down. Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. He's sitting yeah. on the Blackwater. I understand he's in the hotel. He's checked in the hotel. You might want to follow up on that. Well, if he's, if he's there for that meeting as a member of that committee, he may be there to tell him he's not joining. I don't okay, know. Okay. Now, remember, you're on the record. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yes, and you know what today's date is. Yes. Okay. Will you recuse yourself from any inquiries, audits, or investigations your office conducts regarding Blackwater? Absolutely. Okay, we have it on the record. Now, Again. your office has faced major setbacks in retention and recruitment during your tenure as Inspector General, and maybe it's because they were incompetent. And that's what this committee is all about. We try to sort out what is fact from what is fiction and gossip. We seek the truth. And the truth has no R or D or I. The truth is the truth. So don't feel you're being badgered. We're asking you so you can tell us what your truth is as you know it. Now, since you became IG in 2005, a significant number of your senior managers have resigned. The Assistant IG for Investigations, the Deputy Assistant IG for Investigations, the Deputy Assistant IG for Audits, the Head of the Office of Information Technology and Counsel to the IG, and the Head of the Audit Division told our investigators the rate of turnover in his division is 20 to 30 percent per year. Can you comment on that and can you get us closer to what the facts really are? Yes, and thank you for allowing me to speak the facts. The facts are that when I came into office of the seven assistant inspector general level positions, five were vacant. This is nothing new. Th this office has been in disrepair. I think one of the good things I've done is to bring some good people into the office. And the people that I have brought in, um, for example, you talk about counsel. Um, I believe we're talking about the same person. That person was a wonderful person to come in. He was so well suited. It took me a couple of months to entice him to come. He came, he joined us, and he left in about six or eight weeks for two reasons. One, we were not able to give him a permanent SES position. The State Department did not have or could not give me a, a an SES position for someone who came from a comparable SES position. And so we had to do a temporary kind of thing. And secondly, when he realized that his, one of his major assignments was to oversee the investigations group, which is the group that is the subject matter of much of this, uh, he decided that he did not want to serve in that capacity, especially in a temporary IG position. So my counsel, the loss of my counsel was a great loss to me. Um, the losing the AIG for investigations and the deputy AIG for investigations, again, is in part why we are here. They are two gentlemen that I lost confidence in. I think for good reason. I don't think it's necessary to go into this. But I finally, after two years, confronted each of them with my loss of confidence. I asked each of them if they would stay at the same pay grade 
uh, and do the kinds of things they had originally trained to do in special agent in charge positions or some other position of their choice, but to give up their management positions as assistant and as all right, deputy. Let me just interrupt you because my time is all sure. What's up? Uh, it is being said about your leadership and the department which you head that you have created, your actions have created an abusive and hostile environment that led to low morale and the staff to exiting. And there are many statements that we have. I don't have time to read because we've got to go to the floor and vote. But can you uh, describe for us, and I think the chair might allow us an intermission, go and vote. Get his response and then we're going to break. All right, yes. thank you. A and again, thank you can, for. Can you yes. describe for us what those comments really mean? What was so hostile about the environment? Let me say in all honesty that the, my experiences in my prior life to this, the 40 years in the private sector, my athletic experiences, all the things I've done in life really didn't prepare me well for what I found in OIG. And I've not handled it as well as I wish I could have handled it. I was used to, as one of the gentlemen said before, professionals. I never even worked for a corporation. I have only worked for four professional partnerships, two of the leading accounting firms in the world and two of the leading law firms in the world, where the trust among partners was very strong. And when you could count on what they would say, and if you needed to disagree with someone, everyone understood that you had the same mission to make the product of the firm better. And so there wasn't the personal affront when you tried to change what somebody was doing or correct it. I, that didn't prepare me for what I found where people didn't have the same level of trust within, with each other, where there are great rivalries between offices within our organization, between the Foreign Service people and the Civil Service. And I found myself particularly unable to deal with situations where I didn't think I was being dealt with honestly and fairly, where I was being given answers that were implausible. Uh, and in response, yes, I have been brusque, I have been shrill, I have been um, hard on people. Um, I think abusive may be strong because I don't intend okay, to abuse let me, anybody. Let me get to, I've got to go. But uh, if I send you these statements, would you respond to them in writing? I will send you the statements. I'd like to get the response in writing. Thank you so yes. much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Um, Mr. Krongard, we have four votes on the House floor. We're going to recess until 12:10. Uh, uh, I think we'll be ready at that point to uh, reconvene the hearing. So we're going to stand in recess. Meeting of the committee will come back to order. I'd like to now recognize Mr. Plants. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to yield my uh, time to Mr. Shays. Thank you. Um, Mr. Waxman, uh, I, I need to confirm with your own staff, and you may want to consult with them, but first off, we would have a conceptual disagreement about witnesses that have uh, come before the staff to respond to questions and whether that is adequate uh, to constitute uh, information to this committee. I think uh, people who make charges should have to face the public uh, and should have to face uh, committee members. But you said that these individuals were sworn in, and uh, I think that's an incorrect statement. Uh, the OIG whistleblower is named in, his, in your September 18th letter, and three others making allegations against the IG were not deposed. They were not under oath when questioned by committee staff. They were simply interviewed, and the interview was transcribed. They were not sworn. And that's my understanding, and um, I think you said they were sworn and that it should be adequate. If they were sworn in, I, I'd like to have that confirmed, but I'd like the record corrected 
if they were not sworn in. Yeah, gentlemen, yield to me. I'm looking to see if my staff could further inform me about this matter, whether the witnesses were sworn in and deputy. As I understand it, we did a combination. Some were depositions and could, some could, were interviews, could, but if I might finish. Uh, but uh, even if it were an interview, someone testifying in an interview was subject to examination by the Republican staff, and if they lied in an interview, it would be also a violation of criminal law in impeding and obstructing an investigation could, by could, Congress. Would the uh, staff uh, review the o OIG whistleblowers named in the September 11th, 18th letter uh, and the three others making allegations against the IG, we understand were not uh, deposed and were not under oath. I would like uh, to, to have them give us the names of each of these individuals if they would and tell us which ones were under oath and which weren't. My understanding is none of them were under oath. Well, and I think you make a reasonable request and uh, we'll provide for the record the people that uh, uh, were giving depositions and whether they were under oath on, as a, in a right. deposition or whether they were being interviewed which to me also requires them to tell the truth or to be subject to criminal charges. Well, Mr. Krongard was is under oath, uh, sworn in publicly, and he has to face the music publicly. And I think it's an outrage that these individuals, I do not believe, were under oath, and I don't believe they have to um, uh, face the public or the, the questions that we have. Um, so let me now ask you about a financial a statement audit. Um, isn't it true that the State Department did not have a so-called clean financial statement at the time of the office management and budget deadline for the Department's annual financial statement last year? Would that fact be clear to anyone who assessed the statement? Yes, sir. <coughs> there isn't was. It, isn't it true yes. that you disagreed with just about all of your audit staff by allowing the Department additional time to provide some necessary information in the hopes of achieving an unqualified uh, opinion, and can you explain? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, let me make it clear that the OIG does not conduct the audit of the Department's financial statements. There is an independent outside auditing firm that's been doing it for just about ever, I suppose. Right. And the role of the OIG is limited to providing administrative and technical support. When So let me just do it. I understand that you asked for the advice of officials from the Office of Management and Budget and the Government Accountability Office as to the priority of allowing the Department to provide information uh, after the OMB deadline. Can you explain their response? Their response uh, agreed with the course of action that we took. And that I would you, add- That you suggested. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, could I just add that the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants was also consulted and agreed. When the clean audit was finalized in mid-December of last year, did you remove any trace of the qualified unclean opinion and replace it with a clean opinion, or did you make clear that the qualified report initially submitted on November 15th had been subsequently revised? It was the latter, uh, with the result that the State Department was hit twice with the bad news, the first report and the second report. So the bottom line is you didn't protect the administration. By waiting to get a clean report, you affirmed uh, uh, what was suspected. Yes, sir, that's correct. Finally, would you agree that there is a benefit in providing full, fair, and accurate information to the general public regarding the finances of the federal government rather than simply making available the information that exists on November 15th, a sometimes arbitrary but nevertheless useful end-of-the-year deadline imposed on agencies for submitting financial information? That states my concern perfectly. Thank you. Sir, could I make Thank a you. statement? Well, uh, if it's an answer to a question, no, otherwise, uh, we're going to move, move on. If it, well, I don't want to be unfair to you, so go ahead and make yes, your statement. I, Ordinarily, the, your statement time was for your well, statement. Well, but this is in response to something I think you found important. During the break, I did contact my yes. brother. I reached him at home. He is not at the hotel, but I learned that he had been at the advisory board meeting yesterday. I had not been aware of that, and I want to state on the record right now that I hereby recuse myself from any matters having to do with Blackwater. I see. You indicated you had called your brother to ask him earlier whether he was on the board. He told you he wasn't. Well, that was about six weeks ago, and I was not aware. And this board meeting happened yesterday, and I found out just during the break that he had, in fact, attended yesterday. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Lynch? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member. I had some other questions about construction uh, at the embassy, but I'm going to let those go. Uh, Mr. Krongard, 
th this change in your testimony uh, that you're describing now, the discussions with your brothers, is, is troubling, and it raises uh, a number of questions. Uh, I just want to be straight here. Earlier, you testified that you had spoken with your brother, and he assured you that he was not on Blackwater's board. That, that was a testimony you made earlier. And now you testify that he changed his mind, but he didn't bother to tell you. And I have some questions about the timing of all these, these conversations. I have a document here, and I believe you've been shown it as well. This is an email. Uh, I'll let you get it first. It's, it's an email to, Der to uh, Eric Prince, the CEO of Blackwater, from Gary Jackson, the Blackwater official who was setting up the advisory board for Blackwater. He's discussing who the likely candidates are for board members, and he says, and this is a quote from the, uh, from the email, your list, I think, is, is, is buzzy, General Carter, uh, comma, General Grange. Uh, and the significant thing about this, buzzy is referring to your brother, uh, the significant thing about this email is it's dated June 10th. So this email shows that Eric Prince had your brother Buzzy on his short list for, for this board of advisors for Blackwater at least six weeks before the formal invitation was sent on July 26th. Is that, is that correct? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't speak for this email. Well, let me ask you this. When did you have your first conversation with your brother about whether he was affiliated with Blackwater? I only had one. And, and I should make clear, as I tried to say, we, I'm not my brother's keeper, and we do not discuss no, 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 our business you are, with each you other. You are a witness here, and you have testified in the past, and you got this body relying on your testimony. And my testimony, So if I you're not your brother's keeper, it. you need to say, we don't know, or something like that. You can't, say, you can't say, quote, uh, you know, my brother's not on the, on the black As far board. as I knew, that was a correct statement then. It turns out it was the best knowledge that I had. Based on the converse, the only one conversation I had. Okay, which when was, was that? When was the date of your conversation with your brother about it, him being on the black board? It was board? probably about five or six weeks ago. I can't tell you exactly when. Five it was. or six weeks ago. What is it? Was what is, early October, I guess, and, and that's a guess. And during that conversation, what did he say? The, the principal focus of the conversation was the rumor that was out at that point that he no, had. No, but what, what did your brother say? Uh, that, if, that's that would that that would. That would be relevant that, to your testimony here. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, please. The principal focus of that conversation was the rumor that he had a significant financial interest or a financial interest in Blackwater. So the principal focus of our conversation was, did he have a financial interest? And he assured me he did not. Did he say he was approached by Blackwater? He may well have said he was approached by Blackwater, but again, he's approached by a lot of people, so that didn't surprise me. Did but he say he was taking some type of position with them? No. No. Gentlemen, so you six, six weeks ago would have been after the date that he was he received the formal invitation to sit on the board. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't know that he had accepted at that time or not. I just don't know. And it's actually October. You're talking. Well, I'm trying to do this. In reverse, but that would be after the date he accepted the position in September. You're saying you had this conversation with him in October, so he would have already been sitting on the board. And and I, I don't know that because all I see is that the first meeting on the right. board was yesterday. So I don't see anything that suggests. I see where this is going, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would just recommend that uh, we ought to subpoena Buzzy and get him in here. And, and testify as to his conduct and his conversation with his, with his brother. Thank you. I yield back. Would you yield to me? Yeah, no. Uh, gentleman has completed his questioning. I, I, I yield if, back, if, yes. If yes. You, you'd yield to me. Uh, did you tell your brother why you called him? Did you tell him that, that you're being called on as the Inspector General for the State Department to look into actions by Blackwater? You wanted to make sure that you didn't have anything that would amount to a, 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 an appearance even of conflict of interest? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, but the only thing that I knew that had been rumored was a financial interest. I, don't, I didn't know anything about a but, board. But you, you told him why you were asking. Yes. yes. And he said that there was no reason for you to worry, in effect. That was what I told him. And then he him. never bothered to call you back? No. A have you had a difficult relationship with your brother? No, we have gone to great lengths to keep our professional experiences separate because of his position 
and because of my position. Okay. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's my understanding that uh, Chairman Waxman has stated uh, you interfered with an ongoing investigation into the conduct of Kenneth Tomlinson, the head of Voice of America, by passing information about the inquiry to Mr. Tomlinson. Um, can you tell me, did you specifically instruct your secretary to fax to Mr. Tomlinson's office confidential information from a whistleblower, or did you simply ask your secretary to send Mr. Tomlinson the congressional inquiry received by your office? Uh, to, to be factual, it's neither of those. I had no contact, never had any contact at all, either by fax, phone, or otherwise with Mr. Tomlinson. I asked my assistant to fax the letter to Brian Conniff, the executive director of uh, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, not to Mr. Tomlinson. And as soon as I learned the inadvertent event that took place, I took steps to recover that immediately. Um, did you at any point discuss this congressional inquiry with Karl Rove? I've never met, spoken to, or been in the presence of Karl Rove in my life. Did Karl Rove ever insert himself into your office's investigation into the allegations against Mr. Tomlinson? I've never heard of any such insertion. Do you believe that the accidental leak of the whistleblower allegations had a detrimental impact on your office's effectiveness in investigating the claims against Mr. Tomlinson? I don't believe so, and I would have no reason to believe so, because when you really get down to it, the information in there had been in the general public, had been subject to investigations already. The, the date of that was 2003. Um, that in no way is meant to be an excuse for doing it, because it was totally inadvertent. It, it shouldn't have happened. But as to whether it had any impact, I have no reason to believe it had any impact. And the congressman, I also, after it happened, told the congressman in question what had happened, and he didn't think it was any big deal either. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Kronegard to um, expand a bit, if you will, on a comment you made earlier when I was here about your experience in coming into this job um, in comparison with your experience in the private sector. When you talked a little bit about uh, the problem with getting, with the problem in the offices where people didn't seem to work as a team, where there was competition, um, I, I don't think that people appreciate enough the problems the differences in what happens in governmental offices and in the private sector where people don't seem to be focused enough on getting a task done and, and the rivalry that goes on within the offices. Would you care to say something more about that? Yes, I've thought a lot about this, obviously, in the two plus years I've been here. The, I would divide it into two things, at least in my case, a culture clash and an expectations gap. And they're two slightly different things. In the culture clash, I brought with me the experience that people could be openly critical of each other just as teammates are and partners are with the idea of making the product better. And let me hasten to say, I'm not saying that the people in the private sector, I've been accused of saying people in the private sector are better or worse, that is not the case. But in the private sector, in the partnership, the professional partnership environment, you have clients that are paying for the time, and you have huge professional liability if a product is less than perfect. Those two things militate in favor of spending an enormous amount of time to getting to a high level of care in your confidence in the product. I mean, I'm talking about you know 99% care. Because there's no client paying in the government, and because you don't have the individual liability, there's less of a threshold for care. It isn't the 99% that I was accustomed to. So I came with an expectation that people would really exchange freely criticism, there wasn't pride of authorship, and that the whole objective was for the firm to have a better product. 
those things did not stand me well because a lot of what I did was resented. I'll give you another naivete on my part. I honestly believe because of my training in the private sector, when you signed a legal opinion or an auditor's report, the quality went in before the name went on. It was your responsibility to be absolutely certain of what you were saying and using the firm's name. So I believed that all of the reports, the 100 plus reports that are issued each year by my office, that they went out over my signature. I really believed that I had a personal responsibility. I stayed up hours reading every one of those and then making comments on them. Well, that really surprised a lot of people and it annoyed a lot of people. So I, um, I did have discussions with the people in my office and I recognized that I was expecting too much. But I also recognized that the work product of OIG was in fact below where it should be, uh, particularly in the eyes of our constituents. The history in the OIG was they really talked to themselves and they talked to the State Department, they talked to the ambassadors, and that's who they were writing their reports for. I viewed our constituency as the Hill, OMB, many other people, and we needed to be more responsive to their needs, to have reports that were readable and understandable by them. So I used the expression when I talked to my staff from time to time about this, let's meet halfway. I know I'm expecting too much, but I think you've got to do better. And now that, that quote, let's meet halfway, has somehow been turned against me as if it's something wrong. I still believe that concept. I know that I was being too hard. I know I was expecting too much. I know that my background led me to be demanding. And that was not always well received, particularly in an organization where I was specifically retained by the management of the State Department at that time and told, Howard, this is what we expect of you. This organization has not been uh, responsive to the needs of the department in this complex world, and we need some changes, and we need your leadership. Okay. Mr. So I Chairman, I, sure. I'd just like to say that in a nutshell, I think he has pointed out what I have observed over and over and over again in these hearings and in my experience in federal government is that there is very little accountability and very, sense, very little sense of responsibility for producing uh, an outstanding uh, result. And that is our federal government is broken. I think you've pointed this out again. It is broken because of the lack of intensity that we have throughout to do things right. We saw it in FEMA and Katrina. We see it everywhere. And somehow we have got to get some accountability set up for individual members of this federal government so they are held accountable. We've put this man on the, on the block time has and expired. we are not doing anything to anybody else. Generally, the time has expired. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Higgins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this very uh, constructive and substantial uh, oversight of a very important issue. Uh, Mr. Krongard, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad is the most expensive embassy ever built. $600 million in contracts to build this embassy were awarded to First Kuwaiti Trading and Contracting Company. In July, this committee held a hearing in which General Charles Williams, the Director of Overseas Building Operations for the State Department, testified that, quote, the project is on schedule and on budget, end of quote. But the embassy did not open on time and has now been delayed indefinitely due to serious construction problems, including hundreds of violations of contract specifications and fire safety codes, as well as problems with electrical wiring. A fire inspection report obtained by this committee concluded that, quote, the entire installation is not acceptable, end of quote. During the committee's investigation, we identified numerous allegations regarding the embassy that came into your office. For example, your office received at least five hotline complaints regarding the embassy spanning from April of 2006 to July of 2007. Your office also received a letter in December 2006 detailing, quote, allegations that First Kuwaiti had defrauded the State Department through a variety of schemes, end of quote. This person later emailed you directly, and there is evidence that you spoke to this individual personally. In addition, the Special Investigator General 
for Iraq reconstruction warned your office in May of 2007 that, quote, things are going to blow up, end of quote, at the embassy and, quote, important folks are involved, end of quote. Despite all these allegations, you refused to allow any investigations into the Baghdad embassy. Mr. Kromgard, why didn't you allow your investigations division to open any investigation into these claims? And I don't want to confuse the issue or have you characterize that an audit is an investigation. I want to be clear as to what kind of investigation I'm talking about, that of a criminal nature uh, relative to the construction uh, of the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Sir, it's hard to answer that <clears throat> other than to say I never nixed any investigation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I only had, first of all, we had a very limited number of investigators, as I say, 7, 8, 10, 12 at any one time, but only one of whom was willing to go to uh, Iraq. I never turned down anything that was well thought out or justified or supportable. That's all I asked for in terms of um, approving investigations. I never said that somebody couldn't open an investigation. I made it clear all of the many different things we were doing, and you're saying don't talk about audits and, and so on. But the fact is uh, we have done several audits. We have done several inspections. In addition, if you're talking about the trafficking in persons issues, I did tell people at the time, hold off on these until MNFI, IG, and myself get our reports completed and issued. So as to that, we did do that. There has been an investigation going on, which I did approve. Uh, the, the investigators, they may be back by now because I'm a little out of the loop, but they were there for some six weeks or whatever it's been. So I, I don't uh, think that I have um, shut down anything. Uh, there have been recommendations made to me uh, from the investigators that I did not agree with. Um, yeah. And I could go into those if you like. Yeah, Mr. Congard, your office did eventually initiate an investigation, and this happened on September 11th, one week after your office learned that this committee was investigating your failure to pursue these issues. Uh, your decision clearly came too late. Uh, had you engaged earlier, perhaps some of these critical deficiencies uh, could have been addressed before they uh, erupted as they did. Sir, I don't want to pick on dates, but you said September 11th. I mean, I don't know these dates, but if you say that the investigation was open on September 11th because I was in Afghanistan at that time, uh, this committee's letter was dated September 18th, so it would be the reverse. Okay. Let me ask you this. Uh, the head of your investigations division, John Dedona, stated in an email to your deputy, Bill Todd, that, quote, under the current regime, the view within investigations is to keep working the BS cases within the beltway and let us not rock the boat with more significant investigations. Is Mr. De Dona correct? Uh, no, he's 180 degrees wrong because we had this dispute many times. It was my view that investigations were not pursuing the really meaningful investigations, following the money, determining what U.S. big programs were doing around the world. My investigators tended to do time and expense sheets and, and I don't want to say petty because they're important, but minor violations of people in embassies and one-off uh, visa fraud cases, whereas my, I was trying to push them to do meaningful cases such as uh, visa fraud cases by companies and interlopers who were allowing large numbers of people to come into the country illegally, which constituted a threat to national security, where they were doing uh, cases where somebody uh, imported some product without paying, you know, $15,000 worth of taxes or something. So I would say that the dispute went the other way. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cannon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, just notice, I think today we, we got news that the uh, State Department has made uh, the point that they're not going to send people to Iraq who don't want to go to Iraq. Uh, is, isn't it true that part of your problem here is that you, you, you don't have people that will go to do uh, investigations in Iraq? Sir, you're correct. And as I stated before, two very important audit engagements had to be either eliminated or redone simply because the auditors refused to go to Iraq. Uh, th that makes it sort of hard, right? It sure does. 
Do, are you happy with this a policy of the department not to send people where they don't want to go? Sir, that's beyond my competence. I'm not a policy. I'm not happy with it. I think it really actually is wrong and bad. And I, I love Duncan Hunter's suggestion that we uh, allow people who've been over there who know the culture and may have been injured uh, while wearing the uniform to go back as diplomats. And I think that might actually help our diplomatic corps uh, significantly. Mr. Shays, I'm pleased to yield to you if you'd like Sir, to. Sir, Mr. Shays, I know, has been a great person in terms of going to Iraq. He's been there many times. I've been there, I think, three times. Um, so I sympathize. You've been there three saying. times, right? Yes, sir. My, haven't you, I, my, my sense is Mr. Shays has been there like 18 times. I, I remember. I might, if the gentleman would, would respond to a question, uh, have you, are you the congressman who's gone to Iraq the most? I, I don't know that, but I do know that when I go there, I learn a heck of a lot. And um, what I'm struck with, Mr. Krongard, first off, I, I want to say this for the record. To have been in contact with your brother and to have your brother tell you that he was not involved in Blackwater, and then to find out at a hearing that he actually attended uh, and then left, uh, and to find out he's connected uh, is, is a pretty outrageous thing. He has done you uh, tremendous damage by that the fact that your brother would say he's not involved. And I would like to, to know, um, do you have more than one family member, brother, sister, sibling, or do you, how many siblings do you have? Uh, at this point in time, I have one. Yeah. Wouldn't it make sense, given your position, to have been upfront with your brother to say, since I investigate everything the State Department does, I need to know any contact that you have because I need to recuse myself. Now, the other argument could be, don't tell me anything you have, because then I'm not in conflict. But the problem is, nobody's going to believe uh, you, in, uh, in, frankly. And we can't just say, well, no, they didn't tell me, but they were involved. If they're involved, you need to be away f be, to recuse yourself. And you know that. And it would strike me that what you would do is you would say to your brother, uh, I know what you've done in the past. Uh, we didn't talk, but now I have my job to do. I need to know everything where I may have to potentially recuse myself. Wouldn't that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know what kind of conversation you had with your brother when you were on the phone, but I would be one pretty unhappy guy. Um, I would like to ask you, you've gone on record as saying that you've had no contact with Karl Rove at all. So we're, we, we, we're dealing with that issue. The Mr. Waxman said you interfered with an ongoing investigation into the conduct of Kenneth Thomason, the head of Voice of America, and a close associate of Carl Rove by passing information about the inquiry to Mr. Tomlinson. I'd like to know why did you pass information to Mr. Tomlinson? Well, as I stated before, sir, I did not pass anything to Mr. Tomlinson. I never had any contact either by fax, phone, or meeting with Mr. Tomlinson. Which what is she in? Um, so you have had no... That's correct. Okay. I've had no contact with Mr. Tomlinson. When you, um, when, when you have to allocate, uh, it's a little unsettling as well for you to say you have five, six, seven, nine, ten in inspectors. How many inspectors do you have? Investigators. Investigators. Do you have? Well, it varies because we've had people on medical disability. It's never been, I think, more than like 13. And, well, in numbers, we sometimes... What do you have now? Roughly, if you don't count the administrative people who right. only do, we've got about a dozen or th so right now, 13 maybe. Yeah, and okay. I don't know, there's one that may still be on medical leave. I'm okay, not sure. so, and the issue is they are all involved in particular investigations. Is that not correct? Uh, that is correct. And, okay. and they have differing skills and experience too. Yeah. And your issue is if you move them from one place to another, then you are not going to have them conduct an investigation that. That you, you're going to get blamed no matter what you do, just so you know. It's like a constituent of mine who will say, Congressman, you haven't dealt with global warming. You haven't dealt with the budget crisis. You haven't dealt with the war in Iraq. And the list is as long as they have. And you know, they're right. I have to pick and I have to choose. So the real issue is, what is the motivation behind your making a decision? And I think these are very legitimate questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, Mr. Braley, I think you're next. Mr. Krongard, I want to follow up on the very insightful comment that was just directed toward you by the gentleman 
from Connecticut, and I want to focus a little bit briefly on your background. You are a graduate of Harvard Law School, correct? Yes, sir. And you were a practicing lawyer. Yes, sir. So like those of us who practice law, we were subjected to ethical rules that included rules that governed the appearance of impropriety yes, and sir. the need to avoid the appearance of impropriety. So you were familiar with that concept before you went to Deloitte, correct? Yes. Sir. And then when you went to become general counsel at Deloitte, you not only had your legal background, but you were general counsel to a firm that did auditing and accounting that was subject to its own ethical guidelines that also included prohibitions on avoiding the appearance of impropriety, correct? Yes, sir. And then when you became the inspector general for the State Department, you were a, an employee of the executive branch. Yes. Sir. And so you were subject to the standards of ethical conduct for employees of the executive branch. Are you familiar yes, sir. with those? Yes. Sir. They're found in 5 CFR 2635, and they talk specifically about the need for executive branch employees to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Yes. Mr. Krongard, according to your deputy, Bill Todd, who met with a State Department official, or excuse me, you met with a State Department official in August of 2007, who was implicated in, in potential criminal activity relating to the embassy contract. And one day after the individual was interviewed by your audit division, you arranged a special meeting to speak with the individual privately. According to Mr. Todd, he personally advised you not to have the meeting. And here's what he told us. Quote, and Mr. Krongard said, until they're a subject, why can't I meet with them? And I said, because of the appearance of it. And he said, Bill, I've got to do my job. So he met with them. Do you remember that conversation? Not specifically, no. Then three days after your meeting, that same individual who is a subject of that inquiry failed to show up at a scheduled meeting with the auditors. They were informed that he had returned to the Middle East and has not returned to the United States or made himself available for a follow-up meeting since. And this same Mr. Todd reported that you engaged in similar conduct involving another individual. When you left the United States on a trip to Iraq, this individual was a, quote, person of interest in the Justice Department investigation. And after you arrived in Baghdad, the individual's status was changed to, quote, subject of investigation. And Mr. Todd said he informed you of this fact and advised you not to meet with the individual, stating that it would be questioned by our investigators and would give people cause to comment. Do you remember that conversation? No. I do not, I don't uh, know how it could have taken place because I was gone at that time. Well, this is a conversation that took place after you had arrived in Iraq. In this case, Mr. Todd went a step further and asked the Justice Department to speak to you directly. And according to Mr. Todd, the Justice Department did contact you and warned you not to conduct any witness interviews while you were in Baghdad. And yet, despite these warnings, several members of your staff told this committee that you spent several hours with this individual. And when you returned to the United States, your investigators were so concerned that you might taint their investigation that they had specifically asked you not to tell them anything that you had learned. And nevertheless, you sent one of those investigators an email outlining the substance of your conversation with the individual. How do you explain those? Uh, uh, sir, I, I, I would like to go by if we had the time and one by one each of them, and I didn't write each of them down, but virtually every one of those I disagree with. Let me take the most obvious, the, the Department of Justice. When I planned my trip to Iraq, before I went to Iraq, I was aware of three Department of Justice investigations. I called all three of them to tell them exactly what I was doing, what I could do for them while I was over there, and did they have any concerns about it. Two of them I spoke with in phone, on the phone, and one group I went over and met in person. In fact, some of them really appreciated what I was doing because they didn't know what each other was doing. I knew more about what each of them were doing than they did. So all three of those, and I can give you the names, uh, all three groups, because there was more than one involved from each of those, and I can tell you what groups from justice they were. They knew exactly what I was doing, and as I say, I really ask them, and I've got records to show this, how can I help you while I'm there? Has the Justice Department advised you to recuse yourself Absolutely from the embassy not. investigation? On the contrary, I got, after I had completed my work in Iraq with regard to the new embassy compound, because that was only a small part of what I was doing in Iraq, after I completed that, I got an email that 
was hard to understand, but it suggested, and it may be the one you're talking about, it suggested that I should have no witness interviews. And by the way, I'd like to tell you what I was doing. These were not witness interviews, and I'd like to tell you what exactly I was doing, both with Mr. Golden and Ms. French. But when I got that, I was troubled by that. And so from Iraq, I made contact with and through my deputy, and I forget exactly how it happened, but I spoke with a senior Justice Department official to ask him, am I reading this right? Am I supposed to not be doing this after talking with each of these people? And that person, after checking on it and getting back to us, who was more senior than any of the other people, told me exactly not, that there was no problem with what I was doing. So your testimony is that your deputy and your entire office counsel did not advise you to recuse yourself from the embassy investigation? I don't believe that I was advised to recuse myself. No, I don't. Have, because you, have you ever? But I have, by the way. Since ever, I came back and since the activities of this committee, I have stepped aside from that. Have you formally recused yourself in a public way so that people know you are no longer involved in that investigation? Well, I've sent emails to people. I've told people. Uh, I've told people in the State Department. Um, I don't know what else. I don't do press releases, if that's what you're talking about. Are you announcing today that you have formally recused yourself in front of this committee from any investigation into the an embassy in Iraq? When, when you say any investigation, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. If you're talking about the one that I, by the way, when you say I sent the agent, I didn't send the agent. In fact, I couldn't have. The agent was one of the whistleblowers. If I had sent them to Iraq, I'd have been accused of retaliatory comment. I discussed with him the opportunity to go not only for that, but to do something else that I had been working on there, which he was very interested in. So I presented him with the opportunity. The emails are replete with that. He decided what he wanted to do. Um, Gen so gentleman's time has expired. But there's something I don't understand. Why did you recuse yourself from the embassy involvement? The Justice Department didn't ask you to recuse yourself. Your brother's not working in any way that would involve you having a potential. Why did you recuse Because yourself? of the activities of this committee. Because of the investigation of this committee, you decided you should recuse yourself? No, sir. You instructed me in, in the letter not to have any communications with the people who were um, being interviewed by you and not to allow any communications between them. And I wrote you back saying that was of great concern to me because it paralyzed our office. Uh, what effectively we did was to um, to sort of keep me out of and not to have communications among all of our senior people on the specific issues that you raised, but your, your request was even broader than that. It was not to have any communication at all. Um, Mr. Yarmouth, I'm going to give you the choice. We have, uh, we can do the, your five minutes now, but we're going to have to come back anyway, and uh, it's going to put us pretty close to the time, but we'll, we should be able to make the vote, so it's up Let to Let me you. do it. I'll try to keep it quick, okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, before I ask the one question I want to ask, and it's following up on something that Mr. Shays mentioned, but I want to just refer to um, a comment that Mr. McHenry made early in, earlier in the hearing. He's not here now, but in which he called this a drive-by oversight and also mentioned the fact that this committee had not done anything legislatively based on what we had uh, heard during the course of the year. And I just like to mention that already this year we've we've passed whistleblow, whistleblower protection legislation. We've dealt with legislation related to the free flow of information, government contracting, Blackwater and other private security firms, and and also procurement policies and defense appropriations bill. So I just want to correct the record that uh, Mr. McHenry implied that we not implied and stated that we had not done anything legislatively. Uh, I want to uh, go back just for a minute to the question of the Tomlinson investigation, and you said that you had not had any contact with Mr. Tomlinson, and yet we have people who have told us that the letter that was sent to your office from uh, Congressman Berman and Lantos and Senator Dodd was actually, and a complaint was actually ended up in the hands of Mr. Tomlinson that it was faxed to his executive director. Did, did your office have anything to do with uh, faxing that letter and complaint to the executive director of the board? Yes, is, well, not executive director of the board, the executive director of the organization. The organization. Yes, sir, I did. And um, I could, it, it, the letter, the faxing of the letter was intended, the faxing of the attachment to the letter was inadvertent. And as soon as we learned that, we instructed him to return it to us, and he assured us at that time that it had not been shown to anyone else. Uh, and it was only a day or you so. You say it was inadvertent. I mean, it seems like a pretty serious 
mistake to alert someone or alert an organization that was being investigated that there was a complaint against The, the facts are pretty clear. I don't uh, dispute the facts in any way. I had a phone conversation with Mr. Conniff is his name. Um, because of the nature of the information that was required from the congressional letter, I told him that we would need help at his highest level in getting things like timesheets and information and so on. And he said, you know, what do you, you know, what do you need it for? And I gave him a general background. I didn't refer to any congressional letter. And he immediately say it, said, oh, you're talking about the double dipping and the 40 hour a week. And, and he knew each of the issues. I was brand new. I had only been in office about six weeks. But apparently, and this turned out to be the fact, these same issues had already been the subject of an investigation both by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Office of Government Ethics. So he well knew the issues. So at that point, I said, well, yeah, this is a request on the same issues. And since he knew those issues, I said, I'll just send you the letter and you can see what it is. And I told my assistant, who was a temporary person at the time, fax the letter to Conniff. I don't think anybody disputes that that was the instruction. Fax the letter to Conniff. I, she was within, I, I think, her right to interpret that to fax the attachment. It was not my intention that it include the attachment. I was only thinking of the letter. When we learned, I think it was the next day, that the attachment had been faxed, um, I instructed my legal counsel to call Brian Conniff uh, to ask him to return immediately the, uh, the attachment, and that was done. And it, but in fact, uh, Peter Lubeck, who was um, the person who was uh, investigating this, um, the chief investigator on this matter, has testified that once that uh, one of the witnesses involved said what happened, and this is quoting Mr. Lubeck, what happened as a result of this, two of the witnesses were observed shredding documents related to this case. When I interviewed the two witnesses, they said, oh, we were just housekeeping. Um, so that apparently that letter had potentially very serious. I think that's a leap of faith, sir. I really do. Uh, to, to say that with all the knowledge and all the media attention that was being given at that time already and had been given to these allegations against Mr. Tomlinson to say that a shredding party took place because of my discussion with Brian Conniff, who we have no reason not to trust. He was the highest ranking officer in that organization. Um, I can't say one way or the other, but I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that that is what caused it. Mr. Yarmuth, if you would allow me, I, I'm confused because when Mr. Shays asked you whether you had any communications with Mr. Tomlinson or others that would get to him, you said no, absolutely not. And now it turns out you directed a fax and it inadvertently had an attachment to it which you tried to pull back afterwards. Isn't that a communication? There's a great difference in my mind between the executive director, Mr. Conniff, and Mr. Tomlinson. I answered faithfully the question that I did not provide anything to Mr. Tomlinson. There was no way we could have conducted our investigation without the cooperation of someone at a high level of BBG so we could get the materials we needed, the timesheets, the pay sheets, all of the records. And the person we would go to would be the executive director. Well, let me tell you this. If you ever investigate me and you send an information to my chief of staff, I'm going to know about it. Don't you think Mr. Tomlinson would have known about it? No, because the chief of staff is in a different relationship than the executive director and the chairman of the board. In there. some offices, they talk to each other. Sir, with all due respects, I don't know sitting here today who other than Mr. Conniff we would have gone to to get information of the type we needed. Uh, we're, we have another vote on the House floor. We're going to recess. There, there are four votes, so it will probably take us a, a half hour, but we will come back there. That it will wrap up at that point, but there are some more questions. The committee will come back to order. So I, sir, I want to recognize you for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a, 
a number of questions, but perhaps the one that's most vexing to me, and uh, on the uh, on the staff report for uh, House Oversight, uh, I guess this is the majority report. I'm a little confused. On page 93, oh, I'm sorry, the minority report. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure it says minority somewhere here. I just missed that. Uh, it, uh, it has a quote here that I'd like you to comment on. It appears that following the July 31st meeting at the Justice Department with Assistant U.S. Attorney and Chief of the Eastern District of North Carolina, uh, Robert Higdon, that he wrote, and I think I'm quoting, thank you for taking time to meet with the Deputy Criminal Chief, Jim Candemo. Candelmo. Candelmo and me earlier this week when we were in Washington. We appreciate your, the frank exchange of views and information. We will remain uh, cognizant of these issues and will work closely with you and your staff to move this matter forward in the most expeditious possible way possible. Your decision to allow your case agent to continue to work on this matter will make that much easier. Can you comment on why they would thank you, and then we're sort of hearing the opposite in this hearing? Well, I, I quoted from this earlier, sir, for the same reason. Um, I can only go by what they said to me, both in the meeting where they expressed the appreciation and in their follow-up letter. What is being said, either second or third hand, which I'm just hearing, I don't know how to resolve those. I, I go by what they said to me. Okay, well, I'm, I'm confused. Uh, you know, this hearing, I can't figure out if it's about the Iraqi uh, uh, embassy, or if it's about you, it's about the Rocky Embassy. The embassy is on time and on budget, and normal construction errors, and maybe even not so normal construction errors, are being dealt with, both through your office and through General Williams's office, and so on. And in the case of these specific areas of joint investigation, it appears as though you and Justice, at least officially, and through the, the participation of resources, are working together. Is that what it appears in your case to be? Yes, sir. I, I, I think that's correct. I think at the end of the day, we've been helping them to the best of our ability. So, Mr. Chairman, my question to you is, where's the beef? I, I really have to understand, try to understand your opening statement versus these facts, which seem to have, you know, they, yeah, they're controverted. They're controverted by the empty seats there. Uh, I guess I'm going to switch from the things that don't appear to be here, which there, there doesn't seem to be a case for the Iraqi uh, embassy per se being in trouble, other than it's a big project and there are things to be fixed. There doesn't appear to be any lack of willingness with appropriate oversight by yourself and your office to working together with justice. So let me ask you this. You've got a lot of areas, 252 uh, embassies and missions around the world that you have to do statutory oversight on, that you have to investigate. What are your priorities? I'd like to know what you're working on, because what this hearing's about today appears not to be a problem, but I'd like to hear about the problems that you would uh, like us to know you're working on that, that maybe we should focus attention on. Well, that is a really important question, sir, because when I came into office, one of the things I spoke about at my confirmation and always in the early days was that I wanted my priorities to be set not by the calendar, but by the priorities of the day. And I come from an audit background where you go to the highest risks first. And I used to say, I don't want to have to go to Island in the Sun because I haven't been there for five years, and oh no, you can't go back to Kabul because you were there last year. I think the problem is that when I first came in, 70% of our work was mandated. So what we were working with in order to fix our own priorities is not significant. I mean, we don't have enough, most of our work is, when you say what are we working on, I could tell you a lot of it, but it wouldn't necessarily be my highest priorities. As I said, in investigations, we're doing a lot of time and expense. Well, I'd like to be doing program. Well, let me give you an example of a question that I've had. State Department took a de couple of decades to sell and buy a new embassy grounds in, in Lebanon. They know more than closed escrow, and I'm now told they'll never build there, that they have to find a new site. Is that something that uh, your department looks at the decision process and 
and whether it was a legitimate change in events uh, as a result of the assassination of Hariri, or whether, in fact, this is indicative of a selection process that we may be repeating around the world at great cost to the taxpayers. That is the kind of thing we do, and I, I hate to speculate about something that took place before my time, but my recollection is that before my time, there was an inspection of Embassy Beirut that did get into this issue, but th that's that's my recollection. I can't well, you can follow up for the record. But if we you, would if you don't certainly, mind. and let me tell you, sir, that the one of the things that was highest on my priority list is in the process of being achieved, thanks to the Congress, which was setting up a Middle East regional office. Remember, we're talking about all these people who act in Afghanistan and Iraq. They all have people there. We have never had a single person in the Middle East, whether it's Baghdad or Kabul or any place else. Oh, and thanks to the Congress and my efforts of over two years to try and get support, we were given a million and a half dollars to set up a Middle East regional office, and the people just returned from Amman yesterday where it's being set up. And the reason we've picked Amman is because our problems aren't just Iraq and Afghanistan, they include Beirut, and that's one of the places we want to be. Well, thank you, and thank you for your service. And, and I will end by saying that uh, first week of December, the President's having a Christmas party I have an extra guest ticket. <laughs> After today, I know that you have earned it. I would be happy to have you use my guest ticket for the for the and then you'll get a picture with the president and you'll get to meet him as well. You should. And thank, thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, Mr. Shea, you should recognize. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. First off, I want to say uh, that. What troubles me about this hearing is, that, Mr. Krongard, you have not been confronted by your accusers. You were confronted with a 14-page document. Uh, we don't want our IGs to be politically interfered with by the executive branch or Congress, and yet you've disclosed that you were basically forced to, to recuse yourself uh, because of this committee, when in fact you may not have had to, uh, because of the interference of this committee. Um, the chairman has uh, said something that I think was totally inaccurate. We all make mistakes, but the chairman said, we don't need to have your accusers here because they were deposed by this committee under oath. They weren't deposed and they weren't under oath. John Donilon was, uh, was in uh, regards to the September 18th letter, was an interview, not under oath. Ralph McNamara was made accusations in the 17th, September 18th letter, it was an interview, he was not under oath. Brian uh, Rub um, Rubendal uh, and Ron M uh, Militana, a September 28th letter, they were interviewed but they were not under oath. And Peter Lubeck, October 4th, was interviewed uh, but was not under oath. They haven't come before this committee. You have not been given the kind of courtesy that we have given other members, uh, who, other people who come before this committee to know what they've said, and we can compare their testimony, and they can be under the light of public disclosure, uh, as you have been today. Uh, and then there were two other individuals who are whistleblowers who have made accusations that uh, the majority has choose, chosen not to share with us who they are. Uh, so we can't uh, question them about it because we don't know who they are. So. Um, I just want to say we all make mistakes, and in this case, I think this committee has made a number. You have made a mistake, in my judgment, in not being clear with your brother the importance of him being up front with you, and um, I think that uh, has been really uh, not helpful at all. Uh, that's the one thing that I have learned in this hearing that I think uh, uh, is uh, very uncomfortable to me. Uh, all the other issues, uh, the travel, the allocation of your resources, uh, to me, seem uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, and so uh, I leave this hearing um, thinking that you are an honorable man, you have tried to be upfront with us, um, and uh, I wonder sometimes why anybody would want to work for government. Uh, you ran a big business, you obviously had a lot of employees, so it's not like you don't have management skills. And your point to us, which I accept, is that you came in as a change agent and know you have limited time and probably pushed it a little more quickly in the, pri in the public sector that you c than you can in the private sector. Um, and, um, and that's the reality of uh, working in the public sector. And it's one reason why government sometimes is ineffective uh, because it can't respond to the kinds of changes that we need. 
I would like to ask you, uh, as it relates to the embassy, there have been a number of allegations concerning construction deficiencies at the Baghdad embassy. Does, the, uh, does your office have investigators with the required skills to go to the construction site and add value to an investigation of issues such as the proper wall strength needed to withstand rocket attacks, whether the building is properly wired, has proper plumbing, or has adequate fire suppression systems? No, we don't have that kind of skill. Isn't it true that the allegations of construction deficiencies are being handled by other investigative entities that have some expertise in construction and building security matters? That's true, but without meaning to interrupt your train of thought, can I answer more fully? Be because this is not intended to be self-promotional, but I want this fact out on the table that when I was in Iraq in September, I think I made two very valuable contributions. It was I who insisted upon and obtained the agreement that the fire suppression system would have to be certified by an outside independent third party expert and that an outside independent third party expert would have to certify as to the structural integrity of the buildings. Okay, let me I insisted upon that. Let me ask you, when you went to Iraq, people are treating this as if you were doing an investigation. Uh, my sense in hearing you is that you went as the inspector general to get information in general that you were not conducting any investigation. I surmise from that that you were also trying to determine where to allocate your resources and what areas you felt should be investigated and not. Am I looking at it the way I should be or is there more to the there, story? There's more to it. I was gone for three weeks. I visited five countries and the principal reason for my visit was a class Your visit to each or to five countries? To, to my whole trip. The principal right. visit reason for my trip was to do a classified investigation with the Inspector General of the Department of Defense. That was what my principal reason for that three-week trip was. I carved it out so that I have a couple of extra days on my own in Baghdad because we... So we, that wasn't connected to any investigation? Not connected to anything we've talked about today. And I carved out some time while I was in Baghdad to attend to other things that are of interest to me where I've made contributions, rule of law, anti-corruption, and the new embassy construction. So that was something that I carved out because I was there. It was not the principal reason for my trip. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gentlemen, time has expired. I just want to say, Mr. Shays, again, that the witnesses that uh, uh, talked to our committee staffs jointly and that were put up Excuse to me, is question. This on, is this on your time? Because I used it on my time. I'm just curious. Well, I think this is just something for the record. Okay, because I just want to say I used my five minutes and I would ap appreciate not having to do it. But anyway, continue. Well, it looks like you don't want the record to be complete, but I do no, want to I point out... No, I'd just like out, you to use your five minutes like I use mine. I see. Well, I'm not going to use my five minutes in correcting a record as chairman of the committee. And as chairman of the committee, the procedures by which we have followed in interviewing witnesses is to give them a choice of a deposition or an interview. And we've never heard any objection from the Republican side of the aisle on that process. We don't object Excuse to that. Excuse me, I'm still talking. The second point I want to make is that when somebody interview is responding to questions on their interview as opposed to a deposition, they're still subject to criminal penalties if they uh, lie or misrepresent information. And thirdly, you've never requested that these witnesses be here today. You've come in and completely complained at every opportunity they're not here. I didn't but we never had a request from the Republican side of the aisle to bring them in. So I just want the record to reflect that. Could I ask a question in this regard? Um, yes, certainly. Uh, I, am I incorrect that uh, didn't you say that, that these people had been, had been under deposition and had been under oath? That's what you said, and I wanted to correct the record that they weren't, and that's true. And secondly... Uh, no, I said that some were under oath in a deposition and some were interviewed. And they, and they it were was a not. combination of the two. And they were not. None of these individuals were that made these charges were under oath. And oh, please that's not an accurate right. statement. Please. Maybe the individuals you're referring to, but not all the people we talked to. So let me be clarified. The individuals that I named were not under oath. Uh, I'm going to tell you this, that what I told you earlier. I we will give a truth. list of, the, of the, the people that talked under deposition and then talked under interview circumstances. We gave, for the most part, the people the choice. And, uh, and the question I would then end in, why do, we, why do we swear in a witness if we don't need to swear in a witness if they have to tell the truth anyway? Why are we doing that to Mr. Krongar, but we're not doing it to the people who made the charges? Well, the rules of the committee provide that anybody that testifies before a committee meeting, a committee hearing, must testify under oath. 
the process by which we've uh, interviewed or deposed witnesses has been to give the individual a choice. We've never heard any objection from anybody to that process. We think it's worked well. It's only at this hearing that we're now hearing complaints. And secondly, we never had a request from the Republicans to bring all those witnesses in. We had executive, we had a, a report put out by the Democrats, a report put out by the Republicans. Uh, Mr. Krongard knows well the concerns that we have raised, and he's here to answer them. And he told us, uh, or at least we've seen quotes from him, that he welcomed this opportunity. He may not have chosen it as his first choice of how to spend the day, but this is a, the only way that we think is to, is to get to him in and answer questions. Now, it's Mr. Cummings' turn if he wants to ask. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Um, Mr. Krongard, um, Congressman Shays, uh, just made a statement that I thought was very profound uh, when he said that the one thing that troubled him uh, was with regard to the statements you made with regard to your brother. And um, I came to this hearing today, I must tell you, with an open mind. And I've, if there's been anybody on this committee who over the years has guarded uh, witnesses and tried to make sure that they were treated fairly, I, I've done that. But in the light of all the evidence we've, uh, we have, and it is increasingly difficult, I must tell you to give you the benefit of the doubt and to find your testimony credible. And let me just explain to you why. And I, and I don't, you don't have to look so confused. I'm just telling you what I'm feeling. In fact, the only way you can be credible is if all your employees who have given sworn testimony to our committee, over, over a dozen that is, are wrong in their statements and if the Justice Department is wrong in the information that it has shared with us. Let's just summarize your testimony as we close this hearing. As I've listened, and I've been, not, been, not been in the entire committee, but I've watched it on TV, the Justice Department told us you impeded their investigation. You have told us that not only haven't you blocked the Department's work, but that the Department doesn't believe you blocked his work, so you are telling us you are right and the Department is wrong. The Justice Department and the agent you assigned to the Blackwater Inquiry told us you put your Congressional and Public Affairs Officer in charge of obtaining relevant documents. You have told us that isn't true, even though the Congressional and Public Relations Director confirmed the two uh, other accounts. So again, you are telling us you are right and they are wrong. Your employees have uniformly told us of the abusive and hostile environment that you created. This morning you told us the problem wasn't with you but was a reflection of the low quality of the people working for you. In fact, you previously told, told, them, told them the Office of Inspector General was a, quote, banana republic and belittled the standards they followed. In response, your chief counsel, Eric Hart, told us that, quote, I think everybody in that room was personally offended by that statement. I was offended. I come from a military background and my standards are exceedingly high, end of quote. In this case, you are telling us you were right. And again, your senior employees were wrong. Despite the recommendations of the head of your audit division, your chief counsel, and your deputy that, that you not, not allow the State Department to replace a qualified audit of his financial statement with a clean audit, you did this in both 2005 and 2006. This morning, you told us that you did this to preserve the integrity of the audit process, notwithstanding the views of your top advisors. And when they objected, you told one of them he was, quote, irrelevant, end of quote. Bill Todd, your deputy, told the committee that, quote, Howard said I was wrong. Howard told D Dutta he was wrong and how it told Eric Hart he is wrong, end of quote. A number of your senior advisors told us your personal investigation into First Kuwaiti's uh, alleged labor trafficking was unorthodox, didn't comply with any standards, quote, unquote, was, quote, an embarrassment to the community, end of quote, and, quote, an affront to our profession, end of quote. But this morning, you stuck to your position and insist you were right and they were wrong. A number of those same advisors in Justice Department have uh, also told us 
They warned you that your proposed participation into an ongoing criminal inquiry was wrong and could taint the real investigation. Again, you've insisted today that you were right and they were wrong. In fact, the only time today that you've admitted you were wrong relates to your, your, your brother, Buzzy uh, Krangad. Uh, you were adamant this morning that he did not serve on the Blackwater Board. As a matter of fact, you, 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 after you gave your statement, you were emphatic that you had talked about him and gave me the impression that you had just talked to him recently and then came back and said that it had been a while. I'm just saying that was the impression I got. Uh, and Mr. Krangad, I just don't believe that everybody is wrong and the only one who is right, and you're the only one who is right. But I will give you one more chance to reflect and these overwhelming facts and reconsider your testimony. And if you'd like to do that, you may. Thank you, sir. I'm not sure I can do every one because I wasn't writing fast enough. Let's start with DOJ. Uh, I'm accused of being impede, of, uh, impeding their investigation. And you say that I'm disagreeing with them or the people who are speaking for them. When I read you the letter, which reflects exactly what they said, and that letter very clearly makes the point that I was cooperating with them. They appreciated what I was doing. They liked my candor. They liked the fact that I had given, assigned to them a good investigator. So I don't think it's a question of my saying that they're wrong. I'm relying on their own words. With respect to the congressional and public affairs person, it is true as to the documents. You said that I did not, that I said that the, um, I denied that the congressional and public affairs person was responsible for getting the documents. I, I stated, the contrary, she was because she was doing it for Seeger as well and therefore it made it easy to do it for both. What I said she was not doing was any investigative activities. She wasn't an investigator, I agree with you. Mr. Congar, just I want to interrupt you for one second. That letter from the Justice Department was after the July meeting that you had with them. Yes. The complaints we're getting are from all the things you did after that. Well, let me, so I, I, just let me chronology. get to that then. Okay, I, I was I following the, the Congressman's order, but let me get to that. I made it clear in my testimony, and I will stand by it, that I communicated by phone and in person with each of the three branches of the Justice Department that had investigations, to my knowledge, before I went to Iraq, told them what I was going to do in Iraq, and asked them if there was anything I could do to assist them. I don't know what else. I, I'm not disagreeing with them. I did talk to them, and I know what they said to me. So I, you know, I do disagree with you on that. Um, I'm not dis d disputing that the problem is all somebody else's. I didn't try and say that. I tried to say I have been um, very hard on the people. I came to do a very difficult job. I gave up a lot to come down and do that, and I wanted to make the contribution that was expected of me, and I wasn't prepared very well for what I found. And yes, I've created an environment that a lot of people felt uncomfortable, but you haven't heard from any of the people that like what I'm doing and admire and respect what I'm doing. It would have been nice if some of those people had been uh, consulted. But I am not saying the problem is all with them as far as the work environment. It is a work environment that I have been very demanding. I have been very critical. I have tried to get to a high level of care. When, when I read every report and I make comments on it, some people view that as micromanaging. Some people view that as interference. Each of the seven names, I believe, that Congressman Shays read with respect to giving this adverse testimony are all from the investigations group. I came into a situation where that investigations group had never been managed. They viewed any management, any oversight as interference. So yes, I'm part of the problem. Uh, I've tried to deal with it. I, I would like to do better. There are emails in here, frankly, that I'm embarrassed to see in print when I see them in print by themselves without seeing what led to them and what pushed me to them. But nevertheless, I am embarrassed by them. And it's not been asked. But I'll tell you, I've learned a really good lesson through this. And I'm going to think long and hard before hitting that send button, uh, which we all should. Email is a terrible, um, a, a terrible thing. But so I don't say it's everybody else. As to who's right and wrong on the audit, Absolutely. I knew I was going against the majority, and I believe to this day that one of the best things I've done in the department since I've been here is that memorandum that I wrote with respect to why I was doing what I was and had the support of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, OMB, and GAO. And I think to this day what I did was correct. And the people who disagreed with me, by the way, even though they disagreed with me in principle, acknowledged, including Eric Hart, the legal counsel, that there was nothing illegal about what we were doing, and our role 
as not being the auditor but just being the overseer was only to make sure they didn't do anything illegal or unprofessional. So on that, I really do believe I was right and the other people were wrong. And you know, so be it. I, I, that's the way. On the, um, the work on the new embassy compound, as I say, I've made real contributions there with respect to the getting the uh, suppression, fire suppression system certified by an outsider and the structural integrity. That was, I pushed for that and I demanded it and I got it. So I have tried to do the best job I can. That's all I can tell you. I'm not perfect. I'm not going to be here telling you everybody else is wrong and I'm right. Um, I see Mr. my time is up. Thank your, you. Your time is up. Mr. Krongard, um, the, the thrust of uh, those last questions is you're right and everybody else is wrong. That's the way it appears to some of us. But uh, what, what uh, strikes me is the enormous gap between your strong reputation in previous jobs and your performance as the Inspector General. And there's a string of incompetent actions that you took. Now, I took notes when you testified originally and you said, um, I took on a mission that put me in conflict with people resisting change. And then you also said, I never allowed staff to affect my judgments. I sometimes think that's an incredible statement because you had staff there that should have affected your judgments because many of them had more information, knowledge, experience than you did. Now, all the people that were critical were not from the ins inspections unit. Bill Todd said that what you were doing was very unorthodox. He was the Deputy Inspector General. Patty Boyd said your audit was an embarrassment. Eric Hart, your counsel, said it was wrong to give the State Department more time on the audits, which you did for two years running. Uh, despite strong warnings from the Justice Department, you insisted on meeting with a person of interest. You, would, you investigated and wrote a report on human trafficking that was widely ridiculed, ridiculed by your career investigators for being the furthest thing from an investigation. Your staff specifically warned you not to debrief them on your discussions with subjects of investigation for fear that it would taint their investigation. And you then proceeded to send a detailed email to one of the agents doing exactly what they asked you not to do. In the case of Ken Thomason, you shared with him a whistleblower letter detailing the allegations that were being investigated. Uh, and there were other instances. Um, the, the, you met with two State Department officials who were persons of interest, and that was a problem. Uh, there's one area after another where you seem to ignore the people who had ideas of what to do and instructed you that they thought there was a problem, but you put your judgment over theirs. And I'd submit it looks like your judgment in every case was not better than theirs. Um, this record of incompetence is completely at odds with your previous professional reputation. I don't know how to reconcile the two, but I know that we can't ignore the facts. You have a critical role as an Inspector General for the State Department. The State Department uh, needs your help to make them more effective and to make the most of their resources. And the challenges that are facing the State Department are enormous in Iraq, particularly. Uh, they have profound implications for our relations with the entire world. So you have to do the oversight to keep them honest. Our job is to do the oversight to keep you and the State Department honest and to make sure that you're doing the job you need to do. Now, our investigation and our hearing today has been belittled by the Republicans. When they were in power, they didn't do any investigations over anything that might embarrass the Bush administration. It's as if they had nothing to do with it all. They were only members of Congress, although the Constitution spells out we have a job for providing the checks and balances. Now that we're trying to do that, we get a lot of criticism. But back to you. I'll take the criticism. Back to you. How is it that you ignore and put yourself at, at a situation where you, you, you belittle the people that are trying to have you do your job right. Are they all wrong and you're right? And are they, and it seems to me it's not just with your question of credibility, it's a question of a lot of what has happened has been viewed as incompetent. How do you respond to some of these specifics and my general okay. comments? Okay, uh, let me and try, And with that, sir. we're gonna end the hearing. Let, let me try, sir, uh, because there's some things that have been said really for the first time to me and are wholly implausible. For example, I've heard for the first time today that I was told not to tell the investigators information that I had acquired in, um, in Baghdad and they didn't want to know it and I forced them to know it. Um, let me read to you 
the email which I sent to um, the agent, I won't use his name, uh, as soon as I got back from, it says, when I was in Baghdad last week discussing so-and-so, here's what happened, and I did tell him. Here's the response from the agent on October 5th. Howard, thanks for the information. I believe this is an area of interest to the prosecutors, so I will forward the information to them as well. Th that seems to me a total acceptance of what I did. I then followed up with him and said, good. Have you had a chance to consider my suggestion at our meeting Tuesday? You wouldn't, we had met. You wouldn't give your emails to the Justice Department because you told them it was, what? Why, would, why didn't you provide the Justice Department the information they need? You're supposed to work with them. They're the, they're the ones in charge of criminal prosecutions, not you. And if they asked for information, why wouldn't you give it to they them? They never asked for this information. Sir, I had not even been aware that there was an investigation because it happened while I was in Iraq. I provided my investigator with the information. I didn't even know he was working on an investigation with the Justice Department. Well, you're reading aloud from emails that are not on the public record. You want I, I that out on the that. public record? You've put on the public record a statement that I was told something that I wasn't told. This is directly contrary. I was cooperating with this agent. I gave him information that he liked. I gave him an opportunity to go to Iraq, and I put the choice to him. I mean, the let me let me just ask you to hold off for a minute because I think you're uh, maybe going to uh, adversely affect other investigations by what you're saying here. Well, but the we have to respond to the vote. He has to be able to defend himself. Well, I'm not going. I'm not going to uh, deprive him of being able to defend himself. But if he uses information that uh, he has, uh, that has some, I I'll submit this right now to you. And where did you get that? It's, it's my emails. It's my record. Now, this is something we subpoenaed this, I, and we never received. I gave this Why to, didn't we get that when we asked for it under subpoena? You have to ask the person who processed this. I gave up my emails to the person processing this. Maybe it was determined that this is, like you're saying, affects investigations. It may be. I wouldn't have gotten into it but for the allegation against me that's been made I know, today. but we asked for the information from you. We even I asked gave it, it to the person. I gave it to You the gave person. it to our committee? No, I gave it to the per I was recused and separated from the production process. I produced all of my emails to legal counsel in my office who was responsible for the production. I don't know if this was produced or not. Okay. As I understand it, the Justice Department objected to our getting that email because they said it was sensitive to a prosecution. And I, now I you're reading that. it. The parts that I read went only to whether the agent appreciated or objected to my providing him information. That's all I've read, and that's my point. You answered his question. Thank you for answering Okay, his can question. I try one more? I mean, there was a whole string. Because you asked why I allowed why I didn't allow my staff to influence my uh, uh, job uh, selection and allocation, and you referred to what I had said before. Not, not job selection, not allocation of funds. They asked you to, to, to uh, do and not do certain things, and you just absolutely ignored them. In fact, the record that they've given us is that you belittled, belittled them. You told them they were irrelevant, that they didn't know what they are talking about. These are people who haven't come before the committee. I know Sorry. that, sir. The, no, these only, are people who have come before our committee. My only point was Not you him. referred to my written and oral statement this morning. I just want to clarify what I actually said. I said the clashes were unfortunate, but I need to emphasize that I never allowed them, the clashes, not the people, to affect my judgment. I did take into account recommendations, positions, and other advice that came from my staff. In the course... You took them into account, but you didn't follow them. I did the best I could. If I felt that my judgment, as I did in the audit question that we've talked about, yes. was better, I followed mine. But mm -hmm. more important, sir, in these deconflict situations, the investigators who are governed by very strict confidentiality, they generally know what they're doing. They don't know what the auditors are doing, and they don't necessarily know what the inspectors are doing, and all don't know what the others are doing. I'm the one that's on the top of this that has to put all this together and make the determinations as to what is good from a resource point of view, what is good from a conflict point of view, what is good from doing the job that I swore to undertake to do. That's my responsibility. Yeah, it's hard, and maybe I don't always make the right decision. But I can tell you my motivation has been nothing different from well, why no one, I came to no Washington No one has attacked your motivation place. except what we're attacking is your competence 
and well, your sir, credibility. I'll stand on my record of competence. You attacked his motivation. The whole letter was attacking his motivation. You basically uh, charged this man with being corrupt. You charge him with so many things. My letter, will, my letter will speak for itself, not it your characterization of it. The facts will speak for themselves, not your characterization of it. Uh, we have a vote, and there are two minutes left. Rather than ask you to come back further, I, I, I think we've gotten to the point where we know what your position is, and we know what others have said, and we know what the Republicans think of this, and, you, and we have our executive uh, summary and the Democratic summary of the information we received. We'll let the facts speak for themselves. And with that, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you for being here. On this morning's Washington Journal, Representatives Patrick McHenry and Brad Miller talk about legislation that makes changes to subprime mortgage regulations. And later, New Jersey.